Majestic Owl Publishing LLC presents Snow Laughing Matter, Book 12 from Alaska Cozy Mystery Series Written by Wendy Meadows, read for you by Madison, the AI narrator Chapter 1 Amanda giggled as a silly clown tumbled off the back of a miniature fire truck and landed on his butt. The clown, dressed in a goofy firefighting suit, quickly grabbed his painted cheeks with frantic hands, jumped up as if he were the one on fire, and ran over to a burning dollhouse surrounded by other silly clowns. Each clown was desperately trying to throw pails of water onto the burning dollhouse, but were splashing each other instead. Oh, these blokes are a laugh. Sarah grinned, took a bite from a cherry-flavored snow cone, and watched the fireman clown who had fallen off the back of the fire truck run over to the burning dollhouse and begin blowing on it with his mouth. A clown standing close by kicked him in the butt and ordered him to go get a pail of water. The crowd laughed. I'm glad Manford invited us to this winter circus. Amanda glanced over at Sarah. Are you sad he isn't living with you anymore? I was, Sarah confessed, but he seemed so happy to be traveling with this new circus. Sarah spotted Manford among the clowns, wiping water off his clown costume. The guy appeared to be thrilled. I'm glad he convinced Mr. John to bring the circus to Snow Falls. This town needs to laugh. I couldn't agree more, Amanda said, patted Sarah on her arm and went back to watching the show. She dipped her hand into a giant red and white popcorn bucket and drew out a handful of buttery popcorn. They sure are funny, she giggled. Sarah smiled. It was nice having Manford home, even for a short time. Sure, she was trapped in the middle of an icy winter that was far from being over, but so what? She and Conrad were trying to have a baby. Amanda's husband had come home and stayed for a bit before being called back to London. Manford had managed to get hired by a decent circus that paid him good money. And no more murderers had showed up on the scene since Conrad had killed the monster who had tried to end Manford's life. Life was well, life was good. I wish Conrad were here, she told Amanda. I hate that he's away. I know he has friends in New York and that he's always on call to help them, but I wish he were home. I wish both of our hubbies were home, Amanda told Sarah. She stuffed a handful of popcorn into her mouth and then quickly brushed a few stray kernels off her lovely purple dress with white pinstripes. I'm wearing a new dress and my hubby isn't around to see, she said through a mouthful of popcorn. Only you and these little clown fellas get to see me all flashed up. Sarah glanced down at the plain gray dress she was wearing. She hadn't felt like getting all flashed up for the circus and picked her usual neutral color gray. Although her friend Manford was back in town, Sarah felt sad inside. So far, Dr. O'Brien, the fertility specialist she and Conrad kept visiting in Anchorage, had not been able to give them very promising news. And with Conrad away helping an old friend who had been framed by a crooked cop, she just didn't feel up to being flashy. But she reminded herself she would put on a brave face because Manford was in town. Maybe when spring arrives, we can convince our husbands to drive us to California to see Pete? Then we can both get dressed up. Amanda shoved more popcorn into her mouth and mumbled something about how her husband might as well be living back in London as a silly clown caught the back of his trousers on fire and hopped about. Silly bloke. The crowd sitting inside the large red and white striped tent was warmed by giant heaters that gave the clownish scene a warm glow. Everyone laughed and clapped as the clown antics continued. Sarah recognized the majority of the faces in the audience, including Andrew and his family, who sat across the main ring from them enjoying popcorn and snow cones. Andrew was guffawing at the clowns. Sarah smiled. It was nice to see a good man like Andrew laughing with his family, instead of being caught up in the middle of his tiring police work. This is nice, she whispered even though she missed Conrad and focused back on the show. An hour later the circus performance ended, and she tossed on her thick white coat and trudged out of the main tent into a freezing snow. My, this wind, she told Amanda, squinting against the freezing particles of ice threatening them. Amanda ducked her head down and leaned into the wind as other folks from Snow Falls rushed past them, heading toward their cars and old trucks parked in a large field. She worked her way through ankle-deep snow that was hard, crunching on a layer of ice still frozen underneath. 
at least we had a good laugh. Sarah lowered her face and shoved her gloved hands into the pockets of her coat. Manford said, he'll meet us at the cabin in about an hour. That gives us enough time to cook, she called over the wind, pushing through the treacherous snow. As she did, a hand grabbed her elbow. What in the? Sarah tuned around and saw Andrew. Oh hey Andrew, you startled me for a minute. Andrew, dressed in a warm brown hunting coat, didn't seem bothered by the wind. As a matter of fact, the man seemed as fresh as a spring daisy. I want to thank you both for helping Manford convince the circus to come to town. My wife and boy really enjoyed the show. As a matter of fact, Andrew motioned around at the happy departing crowd as a strong gust of wind tore at the muffler hat on his head, I'd say the entire town is grateful. I'm glad, Sarah smiled. I've always enjoyed the circus. Me too, Amanda added. I especially like the food. I'm just sad this circus didn't sell kosher hot dogs. But the cheeseburgers were splendid. All five of them, Sarah teased Amanda, her voice barely carrying over the wind. The night was dark now, too dark. The bright circus lights were enough to chase away some of the darkness, but Sarah knew the drive back to her cabin was going to be very cold and very dark. And popcorn and snow cones and cotton candy and three sodas. And still room for dinner, Amanda beamed and patted her belly. Homemade vegetable beef soup, sweet cornbread and a chocolate cake. Yum. Andrew shook his head at Sarah. Your friend sure has an iron stomach. If I ate that much, I'd need a stomach pump. That's because you aren't from London, Amanda joked. I guess, Andrew laughed. Well, I'm due at the station for night duty soon. I just wanted to say thanks. I'll see you ladies later. Bye, Sarah waved at Andrew. Bye, Amanda called out. She watched Andrew vanish into the crowd and then patted her belly again. Maybe we can bake two pans of cornbread instead of just one. Sarah laughed. Oh you, she said and pulled Amanda toward the parking lot field. Hop in. Amanda hurried into the passenger seat of Sarah's Jeep and began rubbing her gloved hands together. The light from the circus barely reached the parking lot and the inside of the Jeep was completely dark. But she immediately knew something was wrong. Something was squishy. Hey, what is this? Amanda quickly jumped back out into the icy wind and felt behind her. Is this pie? She asked, raising her gloved right hand in front of her face, examining what appeared to be the contents of a coconut cream pie. Sarah ran over to Amanda. What's wrong? She asked. This? Amanda exclaimed in a disgusted voice and showed Sarah her gloved hand. I just sat on a pie. Sarah made a confused face. A pie, she asked. Amanda nodded her head. Stand tight. Sarah carefully peeked her head into the passenger seat and spotted the pie Amanda had sat down on. You're right, she said and pulled out an aluminum pie pan, the kind that was available at any local grocery store. A pie. A ruined pie now. Oh, that Manford, Amanda fussed and began slapping pie from her backside. Oh, my coat is going to need a good wash. Sarah studied the pie and then looked at the pink coat Amanda was wearing. She eyed the icy winds grabbing at the pink ski cap on Amanda's head and then eased her eyes off through the darkness. Sure, Manford, she said in a quick voice. In her mind's eye, she saw a creepy snowman wearing a leather jacket and chewing on a candy cane. The snowman was waving at her from the darkness. I'm back, Sarah. I told you I would be, how do you like my present, a pie in the face? Sarah quickly shook the image away. You can fuss at Manford later. Let's get home. Amanda fussed to herself. I'm going to clobber that little bloke, she promised and crawled back into the jeep. Sarah ran around to the driver's side, tossed the pie into the back seat, and then jumped behind the steering wheel and got the heat going. All of a sudden she felt very cold and very scared. Why? Surely, she thought, Manfred had placed the pie in her jeep to trick Amanda. After all, Amanda had been teasing Manfred a lot since he'd arrived back in town, and of course Manfred had been doing his share of teasing too. Surely the pie was his way of getting back at Amanda for calling him a runt. We'll be to the cabin shortly, you can clean up when we get home. 
Amanda pulled off her sticky gloves, made a face at the mess, and placed the gloves down onto her lap. She warmed her bare hands at the heating vent. That little runt is going to get it, she griped. I'm going to wallop him right in the nose, pal. Go easy on him, Sarah pleaded as a worrisome thought entered her mind. The pie in the back seat wasn't frozen. Surely if Manford had hidden the pie in her jeep before his performance, it would have become frozen, the temperatures were well below freezing. Manford certainly didn't have the time to carry out his prank before they got to the car. When the show ended, numerous children rushed Manford and the other clowns, asking for balloons and cheering when the clowns passed out candy. Sure, sure, take his side, Amanda complained. Upset, she studied her sticky gloves and then finally decided to laugh. I guess it was pretty funny, that little trickster. Sarah followed a long line of trucks exiting the parking field, staring at brake lights glowing like hideous red eyes. The pie wasn't frozen, she whispered. What love? Amanda asked. Huh? Oh, I was just talking to myself, Sarah replied as her jeep finally reached the exit. She turned right and eased down a dark road behind other trucks. Amanda turned her head and looked at Sarah. Love, you seem bothered, she said in a careful voice. I didn't want to say anything. Is it because you and Conrad are not pregnant? Sarah felt a heavy sadness touch her heart. I wish I were pregnant, she confessed in a sorrowful voice. I've been praying so much. Conrad has been praying. I guess it'll happen when it's time. Amanda reached out and rubbed Sarah's arm. It'll happen, love, I promise. Prayers are heard by a loving God who doesn't ignore us. In the meantime, there's a reason. I'm not sure what that reason is. Amanda looked at Sarah with a gentle smile. Maybe you're supposed to tolerate my silliness just a bit longer, she tried to joke. Maybe, Sarah struggled to joke back but failed. Her mind was on the pie. If Manford wasn't the culprit, who was? June bug, she said and then bit down on her lip. Oh love please talk to me, Amanda begged. We're sisters. Sarah slowed down and watched the truck in front of her turn left onto Polar Road. I've been having bad dreams again, she confessed in a low whisper. The snowman is back. Oh love, why didn't you tell me? Sarah shrugged her shoulders and focused on the road. Black ice could be anywhere. She quickly glanced to her left and saw nothing but snowy woods, and then looked to her right and saw the same. Ending up in a ditch on a dark night wasn't her idea of fun. I don't know. I guess I was hoping the dreams would go away. But they haven't? Amanda asked in a worried voice. No, Sarah confessed in a tragic voice. Last night was horrible. Care to tell me what you dreamed? It helps to talk. Sarah wasn't certain she wanted to tell Amanda about her nightmare, but then realized that her best friend, her closest and dearest friend in the entire world, truly cared and wanted to help. How could she block out the one woman she considered closer than blood? I was standing on the beach. Los Angeles was towering behind me, glistening in a bright sun. I could hear traffic, horns, and a car radio playing the morning traffic report. In front of me I saw surfers riding the waves. To my left and right were people old young, kids walking and resting on the beach. A group of kids were playing volleyball. Everything seemed normal. But then all of a sudden a hard cold snow began to fall. People began screaming, wondering what was happening. Then the sun vanished and the sky turned a deep gray and then… Sarah felt a cold shiver crawl down her spine. And then what? Amanda dared to ask. The snowman, wearing that dang leather jacket and chewing on that peppermint candy cane like always. He oh, it was awful, he ripped open the sky and peered down at me with the most awful red glowing eyes I had ever seen, Sarah explained in a frightened shaky voice. Coming for you Sarah, that's what it told me, over and over. Oh love that's horrid. Amanda felt a shiver run down her own spine. Quite horrid. Sarah slowed down and waited for the truck in front of her to crawl over a patch of ice covering the road. June bug, she said speaking in a serious tone. The pie you sat on, it wasn't frozen. Frozen? Amanda asked in a confused voice. Honey, it's freezing outside. 
If Manfred had hidden the pie in my jeep before his performance, it would have been. Frozen, Amanda gasped. Sarah nodded her head. And we both saw Manfred inside the tent the entire time we were there. Before his performance, he was helping sell balloons, and afterward he stood near that group of children that wanted to talk to him. Golly, I didn't think about that, Amanda confessed. So if he didn't? Amanda looked at Sarah. Oh no, please don't tell me. I'm not implying anything, Sarah told Amanda in a voice that frightened them both. All I'm saying, Junebug, is that the pie you sat on wasn't frozen. And with those words, Sarah grew very silent and didn't say another word until they arrived back at her cabin. A pie was sitting in a box placed against her cabin's back door. Sarah removed a coconut cream pie from its generic brown box. Same kind of pie you sat on, she told Amanda in a worried voice. Amanda watched Sarah place the pie down on the kitchen table next to the pie she had sat on. No note, no address, just a plain brown box. Creepy. It is creepy, Sarah admitted. She stared at the two pies and then focused on the brown box. The box was a plain brown box, devoid of any markings. This box wasn't covered with much snow, she pointed out. Which means the box hadn't been sitting out very long, Amanda replied, and then pointed at the pie from the porch. This pie isn't frozen either. Exactly. Sarah walked to the back door and checked the lock. Sorry mittens, she told her lazy husky, who was resting in a brown dog bed next to the kitchen table, if you have to go potty you're just going to have to hold it. Mittens understood. Love, could it be that Manford is playing a prank on us? Amanda asked, keeping her coat on. Or perhaps a neighbor just wanted to give you a pie, or two pies. She trailed off, realizing this sounded odd. Sarah didn't feel like taking her coat off, either. I have a feeling that Manford isn't the one leaving us these pies, she said in a regretful voice. She went to the phone and called Manford's cell phone, hoping the icy winds wouldn't interfere with the call. When Manford picked up on the second ring, Sarah sighed a breath of relief. Hey honey, this is Sarah. Manford was wiping clown paint off his face with a baby wipe. I'm getting cleaned up now, he promised. On my way soon. Sarah saw Manford sitting in a long room filled with bright bulbs and dusty windows. She saw other clowns sitting on stools wiping paint off their faces, talking and laughing. Honey, I have a question for you, okay? I need you to give me an honest answer. Manford continued to wipe at his face while he used his left hand to hold the cell phone. Sarah, I wouldn't give you any other kind of answer. You're my family. I know. Sarah replied in a loving voice. She closed her eyes and saw the two pies on the kitchen table. Manford, someone left a pie in my jeep. Amanda sat on it. And then when we returned home, I found the same type of pie sitting in a brown box at my back door. Honey, were you playing some kind of prank? I mean, if you are, that's okay, but... Hey, no way, Manford insisted. He stopped wiping his face and jumped down off a stool, still dressed in an oversized silly yellow and orange clown costume. Sarah, I know I've been teasing our English muffin a lot since I arrived back in town, but teasing is all I've been doing. I didn't think it was you, honey, Sarah sighed. You were extremely busy tonight. We wanted to put on a terrific show, Manford told Sarah in a proud but anxious voice. This town has done a lot for me. The people in Snow Falls have accepted me as one of their own. I wanted to say thank you in my own way. Manford walked out of the warm tent and entered a cold, icy night that was now filled with falling snow. He looked forward and studied the dark, snowy woods. Someone is playing a prank on you. But by the tone of your voice, you don't think the pies add up to a prank, do you? He worried. I'm not sure, Sarah confessed. There's not much to go on. Amanda decided to get a pot of coffee brewing, while Sarah spoke to Manford. She listened with careful ears and kept a close eye on the back door. Sarah, no one I work with knows you, Manford explained, absorbing the icy winds without care. He needed privacy, and when you lived with the circus, privacy came at a cost. I can't say I know every person I travel with in a personal way. A lot of them are drifters who get hired to do all the manual work. 
Only the performers are regulars. I wouldn't know who would want to pull a prank on you. Manford glanced back over his shoulder toward the clown tent. Most of the clowns are pretty good guys, outcasts and vagabonds and entertainers, you know, like I was. I don't pry into their personal lives, but some of them drink after the shows and let their tongues run loose. Maybe someone will say something about who did it. Pies didn't appear until the circus arrived, Sarah pointed out. Two and two is four, yeah I know, Manford worried again. He felt a gust of icy wind grab at his hair and quickly tuck down his chin. Circus arrives, you get pies. Sounds like the case is closed. It could be honey, Sarah pointed out, or maybe whoever left me the pies wants me to believe the culprit is part of the circus. Well, you're the detective, Sarah. You caught the back alley killer. And nearly let the same killer end my life, Sarah pointed out. Honey, I may be a retired homicide detective, but that doesn't mean I'm invincible. Detectives play it by ear all the way to the finish line. Don't sell yourself short, Sarah, Manford begged. You're all brains and you know it. Well, thank you, honey, Sarah told Manford and then let out a worried breath. Right now, no amount of brains is going to tell me who sent me these pies. Sarah glanced at Amanda and watched her friend carefully measure out the coffee grounds. It could be the pies were aimed at Amanda. Then why did you find a pie at your cabin and not hers? Manford asked. Now who is the detective? Sarah laughed. Manford watched the snow fall through the bright beams of light created by the circus bulb strung up in front of the main tent, as his cheeks quickly turned to ice. He had fallen in love with Alaska, but sure didn't like being cold. I'm gonna hurry and get dressed and head your way, okay? Stay alert until I get there, and make sure you have your gun. My gun is attached to my ankle honey as always, Sarah assured Manford. Don't speed, okay? There's black ice on the roads. I'll be careful, Manford promised with an eye roll, but loving Sarah for caring about him so much. Just have the coffee waiting. And oh, is Amanda with you? She's making coffee as we speak. Good, Manford said in a grateful voice. That gal is always good to hive around. She's special. But please, Sarah, don't tell her I said that. She would never let me live it down. Your secret is safe with me, Sarah promised. Manford studied the dark night with worried eyes, hesitating. Sarah, you made a lot of enemies being a cop, didn't you? I yes, Sarah told the truth. A cop always makes enemies, Manford. It's part of the work. The person who left the pies. Could be someone I made an enemy of, yes, Sarah informed Manford. Or maybe the person could be someone working at the circus, or someone who is targeting Amanda, or even you. Manford, as a detective, you learn to have a lot of theories, endless questions and a whole lot of thinking time. It takes time. Yeah, I guess that makes sense, Manford nodded his head. Look, I better get back inside the tent and get cleaned up. I'll be over to you soon. Be careful. Please. You bet, Manford promised. Sarah hung up the phone. Manford is on his way, she explained and slowly walked back to the kitchen table and began examining the pies. My guess, if I had to guess, is that these pies are store-bought. Look at the crust. Amanda joined Sarah at the kitchen table. She watched Sarah break off a piece of pie crust and crumple the crust between her fingers. Yeah, love, that's not freshly baked pie crust, she agreed. Sarah bent down and smelled the pie that had been left at her back door. Pie doesn't smell fresh either. Amanda smelled the pie. I guess it doesn't, she agreed. Our local store doesn't carry coconut cream pies, and the diner only sells apple and pecan pie, Sarah pointed out. Which means these pies came from out of town, Amanda nodded her head. Now we're getting somewhere, right? She asked in a hopeful voice. I can call Andrew and have him check each pie pan for fingerprints along with the box, but... Sarah shook her head. But what, love? Amanda asked. Andrew would call Conrad and Conrad would rush home. And that is a bad thing? Amanda asked in a confused voice. Sarah glanced toward the back door and then decided to sit down. June bug, Conrad blames himself for me not being able to get pregnant, she explained in a heavy voice. 
Dr. O'Brien has assured Conrad he isn't the one to blame. My body is being very stubborn. Sarah stared at the two pies resting on the kitchen table. Conrad needed some fresh air. He was happy when Matthew called and asked him to fly to New York. If I have to call him home over something that could be nothing? Sarah shook her head again. Maybe that's all this is, nothing. Amanda wasn't so sure. But what could she say? What did the two pies really mean? Oh, love, she sighed and plopped down in a chair, tonight was supposed to be fun. And now look at us, all knotted up again. Amanda put her chin down on her hands. I thought the hot springs were the worst of it, but trouble keeps coming our way, over and over and over and over again. June bug, maybe these pies don't represent trouble, Sarah said, even though deep down she knew that the pies were meant to serve as a dangerous message. Maybe someone is trying to play a prank, just for fun? I would honestly love to believe that love, Amanda told Sarah in a painful voice, but you're having those nightmares again and that's always bad news. I wish the nightmares would go away, June bug. Sarah stood up and decided it was time to remove her coat. She didn't want to feel afraid in her own home. I have to go use the bathroom. Hurry, Amanda begged. Sarah hung her coat up on the wooden coat rack next to the back door and left the kitchen. She walked through the living room, looked at the fireplace, and debated making a fire. Not now, she said and made her way down a hallway to her bedroom, headed for the master bathroom. Amanda stared at the two pies and then slowly removed her coat, examining the sticky pie filling still stuck to the back. She shook her head and hung the coat up. That's going to be some dry cleaning bill, she complained and walked back to the kitchen counter to check on the coffee. As she did, the telephone rang. Oh, please be Conrad, Amanda begged and rushed to the phone. Hello? Amanda? Pete asked in a quick voice. Oh, hello, Pete. I. No time, kiddo. Get me Sarah. Pete sat down at an old desk he had dragged into his new office at the private investigation firm he and Sarah had created. Being retired stunk, working as a private investigator made him feel like an old 1950s detective slinking through the foggy streets of a town filled with crime. And Los Angeles still had plenty of crime to go around. Oh, she went to the potty, love. Pete grabbed a half-smoked cigar and shoved it into his mouth. Tell her to call my cell phone as soon as she gets out. This is urgent. Pete stared at a coconut cream pie sitting on his desk. We've got trouble, he added, grabbed a pack of matches and lit his cigar. Amanda closed her eyes and began making a pained face. Pie, she asked. How did you know that? Pete demanded, dropping his cigar into the ashtray, astonished. Has Sarah received any pies? Have you? Amanda asked in a shocked voice. Yes, Pete told Amanda. After so many years of Sarah and Amanda being best friends, Pete knew Amanda was part of the team. He thought of them both as his family, and Amanda especially like a daughter. Have you? Two of them Pete, Amanda blurted out in an urgent voice. We went to the circus tonight. Sarah called me earlier this week and we talked. I know all about the circus, kiddo. Amanda nodded her head. When the show ended, we walked outside to her jeep. A pie was waiting in the passenger seat. I sat down on it. Amanda looked at her coat. I'm going to have quite a dry cleaning bill. Pete puffed on his cigar. You didn't see anyone? No one, Amanda confessed. There's more, Pete. When we arrived back at the cabin, there was a pie waiting in a box at the back door. My pie was waiting outside the office door, Pete told Amanda. I nearly tripped over it. Pete puffed away on his cigar. Any notes? Nothing. But Sarah and I do believe the pies are store-bought, if that helps. Pete snatched a note up off his old desk. My pie came with a note? Should I dare to ask what the note says? Amanda asked in a miserable voice. Oh, tonight was supposed to be fun, circus clowns, popcorn, snow cones, not pies. Pete heard Amanda mumbling to herself. Stay focused, kiddo, he ordered. We're in serious trouble. That's what I was afraid of. Amanda closed her eyes and prepared for the worst. 
Okay, Pete, tell me what the note says. A pie in the face is no gun. A knife in the back is loads of fun. The countdown is starting, so run, 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 you can't escape. The nightmare's begun. Pete tossed the note down. Oh, that's so creepy. Amanda shivered all over. Kiddo, Pete said, I know who left me the note and so will Sarah, he explained in a worried voice. Who? Amanda begged. Pete worked on his cigar for a few seconds. A killer by the name of Clint Junerson. Clint Junerson? Amanda wasn't familiar with the name. Pete, who is Clint Junerson? The clown killer, Pete explained and looked at his office door with concerned eyes. Kiddo, Clint Junerson was released from prison on parole over a year ago. Why I wasn't told this is beyond me. Why in the world? Who knows why? Pete threw down his cigar. The guy killed three people, but was treated as some kind of celebrity by the media. Pete closed his eyes. Kiddo, Sarah and me, were on his list and it seems like he thinks it's time to even the score. Amanda locked her eyes on the back door. She thought she heard the doorknob rattling and nearly jumped out of her skin. Only the wind, only the wind, she said, breathing nervous breaths. Out in the snow, a deadly man in a clown costume stained dark with grime grinned as he stared at the snowy cabin. The circus had begun. Time to play, Sarah. Only now there's two of us. Which one is real? Chapter 2 Sarah walked over to the kitchen table with eyes flooded with worry at Amanda's anxious face. Not good, Amanda told Sarah as her friend sat down. Clint Junerson is loose. Sarah poured herself a cup of coffee and sat in shock, absorbing the news. Amanda recounted the entire phone call and recited the creepy rhyming note. Her hands wrapped around a hot cup of coffee. The coffee, although an old friend, offered no comfort to her troubled mind. Love, you need to call Conrad. Sarah shook her head no. Conrad will fly home and Junebug, Clint Junerson will try and kill anyone I am close to. I can't risk that. I know Conrad is going to be very upset with me, but I love my husband and I'm not going to place his life in any danger. Amanda understood Sarah's feelings and didn't press her friend any further. Instead, she nodded at the two pies sitting on the table. What now? The phone rang before Sarah could offer an answer. She jumped up, expecting Pete. Might be Pete. Sarah hurried to the phone. Pete, oh hello Andrew, what? Sarah closed her eyes. When? Okay, I'm on my way. Amanda slowly stood up on scared legs. A murder, she dared to ask. Pete's words rang in her mind. He wants to even the score. She shuddered. Sarah nodded her head. A man named Brett Slopes was found dead outside the circus near his trailer. Dare I ask how the poor bloke was killed? The killer put a knife in his back. A knife in the back is loads of fun, Amanda gulped, remembering the words on the note that was attached to the pie that had been left for Pete. Seems that way. Sarah quickly retrieved her gun. Get your gun out of your purse, Junebug. Oh, I hate guns, Amanda whined but did as Sarah asked. She pulled a Glock 19 out of her white purse and sighed. Ugly little thing, isn't it? People invent awful ways to kill each other. Why can't we be that inventive about ways to save each other? Shame. Until the bad guys are all dead, Sarah said and quickly checked her gun, we have to make sure the battlefield is even. I'm not fond of guns, but without them the innocent will always suffer at the hands of evil. Truer words were never spoken, unfortunately. Amanda watched Sarah check her gun and then decided to do the same. Okay, I remove the clip this way. Amanda struggled to remove the clip, but finally had success. Okay, I think this clippy thing is full of bullets. Sarah checked Amanda's clip. It's full, she assured her best friend. Amanda hesitantly placed the clip back into her gun and looked at the back door. Can't we just stay home, love? We can make popcorn and bake brownies and paint our nails and pull out unneeded eyebrow hairs and count our fat rolls. I wish we could, Junebug. Sarah grabbed her coat and tossed it on. I wish we were in Los Angeles with Pete. I'm worried for him. Me too, Amanda agreed. She put on her coat 
and felt the back of it with her free hand. Sticky mess. Sarah stared at the back door. Pete is all alone in Los Angeles, she told Amanda. I know Pete can take care of himself, but if he received a pie and we received a pie, Junerson isn't working alone. Love, who is this Junerson bloke? Amanda asked. Pete called him the clown killer. Sarah wanted to open the back door, bravely walk out into the snowy night and face down her fears. Instead, she remained in the warm kitchen. Clint Junerson was once a very famous circus clown, she explained. He began working as a therapy clown, but was fired for punching a doctor. Apparently, he was hired by a well-known circus a few months after he was fired from the hospital. Sarah glanced at Mittens. Mittens was fast asleep. Clint Junerson is a skilled magician and used his talents to become a main attraction. He loves riddles and always added a riddle into his shows. Where does the killing come in? Amanda asked in confusion. The doctor Clint Junerson hit ended up with a knife in his back. No one could prove Clint Junerson killed the guy, Sarah explained. And then the man who owned the circus Clint Junerson was working for ended up with a knife in his back. Again, no evidence could be found that proved Clint Junerson was the killer. A short time later, two clowns ended up dead, and then a woman who worked with the elephants. Those last three murders happened when that circus was visiting Los Angeles. How did you and Pete manage to catch this bloke? Amanda watched Sarah staring at the back door with worried eyes. It was clear that Sarah didn't want to step one foot out into the dark night. Junerson slipped up when he killed his last victim, Sarah explained. He left a riddle lying next to his victim, as he did with each of his victims. The riddle was basically the same as all of the others, a game. The only difference was the woman Junerson killed didn't have a knife in her back. Which means what, love? Sarah finally took her eyes off the back door. The murderer had taken the weapon with him. Pete and I managed to get a search warrant and search Junerson's trailer. We found the knife that had killed his victim hidden in a compartment under the couch. Why did he take the knife? You know, Sarah confessed, Pete and I were never able to come up with an answer. Pete has a theory, though. I would love to hear it, love. Sarah looked at the two pies on the table. Pete believed Junerson didn't kill the woman who worked with the elephants. Pete figured someone else killed the woman in order to frame or blackmail Junerson. We put Junerson away for those murders, but he always claimed innocence about the woman's murder. No one ever stepped out of the shadows to prove his theory right, until now. You mean the person who left a pie for Pete? Sarah nodded her head. Junerson isn't working alone, Junebug. The only question is, who is he working with? And where is Junerson? Snow Falls or Los Angeles? Sarah finally braved the back door. We better get a move on. Amanda checked on mittens. Okay, girl, you have water and food. If you have to potty, just hold it, she pleaded and then found enough courage to walk outside into a freezing dark snow. Okay, gun in hand, safety is now off, aim and fire at anything that moves. Sarah quickly locked the back door, scanned the dark night, saw only snow being roughed up by icy winds and nodded toward her jeep. Let's hurry, she called over the winds. Amanda walked to Sarah's jeep, shooting her eyes left to right, expecting to see a terrifying clown explode out of the snow at any second. When no threats appeared, she sighed a breath of relief, climbed into Sarah's jeep and buckled up. Hurry, she begged Sarah. Sarah paused at the side of her jeep and threw her eyes into the deep night. She saw a hideous snowman wearing a leather jacket appear like a mirage and begin laughing at her. It's not what it seems, Sarah. I'm always wearing a different face, Sarah shook her head. Go away, you monster, she begged. Go away. Sarah hurried into the jeep and slammed the driver's side door closed. Ready? she asked Amanda. I wish I weren't ready, love. Amanda lifted her gun into the air. I wish I was holding a cookie instead of this ugly piece of cold metal. Me too, Sarah replied and got her jeep moving. Junebug, dial Pete's number for me and put him on speakerphone. Amanda placed the gun she was holding down onto her lap, fished out a cell phone from her coat pocket and dialed Pete. 
Pete answered on the third ring. I'm putting you on speaker phone, Pete. Sarah needs her hands free. It's an icy night up here in Snow Falls. What do you have, kiddo? Pete asks Sarah, walking around his office and chewing on a cigar. I hope you have more on your end than I do. A murder, Sarah informed Pete. A man by the name of Brett Slopes. A performer. I need you to run this guy's name for me, Pete. He worked for the circus. I'll give you more intelligence on the crime scene once I get a better picture. Pete walked across a messy office and plopped down behind his old desk. So the games begin, he growled. I couldn't stand Junerson when we threw him behind bars, and I still can't stand that monster. He was almost as bad as the back alley killer. Don't remind me, Pete, Sarah begged. The back alley killer is dead, and so is my ex-husband. It's taken me a long time to be able to forgive myself. No worries, kiddo, Pete promised. I'm not interested in digging up any old memories that ain't worth the shovel. Pete continued to chew on his cigar. It won't be long until I get a murder on my end, knowing this guy's style, kiddo. Junerson ain't working alone this time. I don't think the monster was working alone last time either. It's been over ten years, though. Memories get foggy during that time. Pete locked his eyes on a dusty laptop he hated to use. I pulled up the case file on Junerson and refreshed my mind on a few things. Sarah carefully drove down the road she lived on, watching the windshield wipers fight snow. The snow was getting heavier. By midnight, she worried, the roads would not be passable until the plows were set loose. Any family? she asked. Pete nodded his head. Junerson only had the one sister, remember? I remember, Sarah nodded her head. Kelly Junerson. And if I remember correctly, Kelly Junerson was four years younger than her brother? You got it, kiddo. And at the time of the murders, Kelly Junerson was 20 years old, Pete reminded Sarah. Before the murders started to happen, she was traveling with a rodeo and broke some wild horses in her time. Not the type of woman who sat around in a fancy tea room eating sweet crackers and talking about flowers. That's right, Kelly Junerson did travel with a rodeo, Sarah said in a quick voice. She was fired for, what was it, Pete? Feeding stimulants to horses, Pete explained. Kelly Junerson was feeding tranquilizers to the horses her rivals were supposed to ride, so they'd never hang on through the Broncos crazed bucking. Not good. Sarah turned off her street and began traveling back toward the circus. Where's Kelly Junerson now? According to our records, the girl is living right here in Los Angeles, Pete told Sarah. He pulled up Kelly Junerson's record on the laptop. During these last 10 years, Kelly Junerson has worked mostly service jobs, fast food joints, waitressing, dead end jobs. She is currently working at the Fast Eats truck stop. Some dive that hasn't emerged from the 70s yet. You're going to check on her. Sarah asked in a worried voice. Pete heard the worry in Sarah's voice. Hey kiddo, that's a no no. We're partners. We can't start babying each other. Pete spit out his cigar. The risks are always there. I know, Pete, Sarah said, cautiously steering her Jeep down a dark, icy road surrounded by tall, snowy trees. I'm sorry. I know you have to check on Kelly Junerson. I called the truck stop. Kelly comes on duty at 11. I figured I'd arrive a little early and stake out the place. Good, Sarah told Pete forcing her personal emotions into a hole so she could start thinking like a cop. I think I know the truck stop, Pete. It's that run-down place out past Interstate 10. I know the place, kiddo, Pete assured Sarah. You and I arrested a trucker who committed a hit-and-run at that dive, remember? We did? Sarah asked and quickly searched her memory. The face of a skinny, angry man wearing a neon orange Oregon hat flashed through her mind. Yes we did, but goodness, I was. Very green, Pete laughed. Amanda listened to Pete and Sarah, and felt envy enter her heart. How she wished her younger years had been spent with Sarah and Pete, with two people she loved and adored. Pete, she asked, hoping she wasn't interrupting. Yeah, kiddo. Is it possible that Kelly Junerson could be in Snow Falls? 
The manager at the truck stop said Kelly Junerson has called in sick for the last two nights but promised to be at work tonight, Pete told Amanda. I'm going to see if he's right. If she doesn't show up, then we'll know that we're in a really deep hole. What do you mean? Aren't we in a deep hole already? Amanda asked, confused. Could be Kelly Junerson has nothing to do with her brother, Pete explained. Could be she's a killer herself. Could be Clint Junerson is in Snow Falls, or it could be he's right here in Los Angeles. If Kelly Junerson doesn't show up for work, I'm going to have to put on my hound dog nose. No address for her. Sarah asked. Just a post office box, Pete informed Sarah. And before you ask, Pete snatched up his cigar. Clint Junerson's address is empty. I had an old friend do a welfare check for me. He found a vacant apartment near the beach. Did you report your find? Sarah asked. Not yet, Pete explained. Kiddo, we both know someone worked really hard to get Junerson released from prison. Someone worked really hard to make sure he didn't receive life in prison too. Junerson got off with a cozy insanity plea that saved his backside, Sarah added. Exactly. Pete lit his cigar. I'll check on Kelly Junerson, kiddo. But if she comes up clean, we're really in a deep hole. Pete, we came up empty-handed on Junerson ten years ago. Sarah pointed out in a strained voice. I doubt Clint Junerson is going to make it easy for us this time around. If Kelly Junerson isn't the second clown, then who is? Kiddo, we've been marked, Pete said in a very serious tone. We have our situation to our advantage. You know that. Now stop being green and get to work. I'll work my end and you work your end, and we'll meet in the stinking middle, do you hear me? Pete barked. I hear you, Pete. Good. Pete chewed on his cigar and stared at the laptop on his desk. Clint Junerson is most likely in Snow Falls. He had a sour taste for you. You know as well as I do the guy is dangerously clever, so play smart and be safe. I wouldn't play it any other way, Sarah promised, appreciating Pete chewing her out. Too much emotion and not enough brains was bad for a cop. Okay, Pete, I'm driving to the circus. I'll keep you posted. Let me know what you find on Brett Slopes. I'm running him now, Pete told Sarah. Amanda, stay smart, and don't hesitate to fire your gun. Is that clear? Yes, Amanda promised. You're a part of the team now, Pete told Amanda. Do your job. And with those words, Pete hung up. And be safe, he begged under his breath. Please be safe. Manfred hurried over to Sarah and Amanda. I didn't do it, he insisted, ignoring the snow and freezing winds. He was wearing a thick brown winter coat almost too large for his short stature, but he still looked frozen to the core. I barely knew the guy. Of course you didn't. I would never suspect you, Sarah said with shock. She squeezed Manfred's hand to reassure him, and then walked with him through a crowd of cold circus workers standing out in the snow and entered the main tent. She spotted Andrew talking to an old woman who had the longest, grayest hair she had ever seen. Manford looked up at Amanda. And what about you? Do you think I did it? He asked in a worried voice. Amanda paused in front of a set of wooden bleachers stacked on cold hay that was sticky with spilled snow cones and sodas. She looked out into the main ring and sighed. Listen, you crazy little bloke. Of course I don't think you're the killer. I just wish... The dark cloud that has fallen over this circus didn't happen in our little town. Andrew waved at Sarah from across the way. Manford, who is Andrew talking to? Sarah asked. Mrs. Lacey Armington. She owns the circus, Manford explained. Well, Mr. Armington, her husband, used to be the head dude in charge, but he kicked the can not long before I started work. I was told he put his head down at his desk and never woke up. Sarah studied Lacey Armington. Okay, you two stay close, she said. Amanda, keep your hand on your gun and keep the gun hidden in your coat pocket. I'm not leaving your eyesight, Amanda promised. Sarah nodded at a few cops she knew standing around. Andrew has our guys in good positions. I don't think we're in any danger. Sarah waved at Andy, Ralph and Steve. How are you doing, she called out. The three cops waved back. 
If this snow was water, you'd be right at home, Andy called back in a joking voice. Snowfalls is never boring when you're in town, Sarah. Sarah faked a polite smile and calmly walked over to Andrew. Mrs. Armington, I'm... Sarah Garland, Lacey told Sarah in a happy voice. Or should I say Sarah Spencer? I know all about you. I was living in Los Angeles when you captured the back alley killer. Oh, I was so pleased to learn we were in your new hometown. Sarah faked another polite smile. Thank you, Ms. Armington. Oh, for goodness sakes, call me Lacey. My husband, rest his soul, called me Lace. Poison Lace, Lacey joked and let out a rough cackle, her voice scarred from years of smoking. My husband swore my cooking was going to kill him. Amanda grinned from a distance. She could plainly see Lacey Armington was a character. Looks like you have a fun boss runt. Manford rolled his eyes. How many times have I told you to stop calling me runt, you dry muffin? Amanda nudged Manford's shoulder with her elbow. I'm an English muffin runt. Manford rolled his eyes again and then sighed. Lacey is a fun boss, he told Amanda, giving up the battle. She's tough but fair and sure is a stickler about safety. She makes every performer rehearse his act over and over and over. Amanda focused back on Lacey and listened to her talk to Sarah. My husband went in to do the books and dropped dead from a brain aneurysm. He was a good fella who never did me wrong. Sarah sensed a southern accent coming from Lacey. Ms. Armington, ah, uh, Lacey, where are you from? A little town east of Chattanooga, Tennessee, Lacey told Sarah in a proud voice that only a southerner could muster. I was raised outside of Macon, Georgia, but my daddy moved me to Tennessee when I was 15 years old. His brother, my uncle Robert, rest his soul, got my daddy a job as a machinist. Now my daddy was one for the bottle and had a hard time. Ah, uh, maybe you can tell me about your daddy some other time? Sarah interrupted in a polite voice. Right now I need to know about Brett Slopes, if that's okay. Why sure it is, Lacey promised. She shoved her hands into a bright green coat that fell down over a thick black dress. Brett Slopes was a drifter before he joined us, and a drinker. I hired him when I was in St. Louis. He worked setting up and taking down the tents. He was a veteran served eight years in the army as a field soldier. He served from 1981 to 1989. Lacey shook her head. Brett told me he lost himself to the bottle after his first wife left him in 1985 for some rock and roll guitar player. He said by the time he left the army in 1989, he was a full-blown alcoholic. Sarah was impressed by Lacey's memory. The woman looked to be in her mid-sixties and seemed not very well educated and a simple soul. Yet underneath her long gray hair and southern accent, shone a brilliantly clever woman who had a memory like a steel trap. How old was Brett Slopes? Let's see, Brett said he was 29 when he left the army, he was born in July, so I'd say he was 58. But don't let his age pull the wool down over your eyes, Lacey warned. Brett was strong as a bull. Any idea who killed him? Sarah asked. Lacey frowned. I sent Brett outside to check a few loose ropes. Lacey pointed to the north side of the tent. I noticed a weak spot. I can't say I know of anyone who would want to kill that poor man. Lacey sighed. Brett was trying to get sober. He was honest and hardworking. Can't ask for nothing more. How long did Brett Slopes work for you? Sarah asked. Andrew waited for Lacey to answer. Two years, give or take a week, Lacey answered. I'm sure going to miss him. Lacey looked deep into Sarah's eyes. Sarah Garland, you listen to me, she said in a sharp tone. I know all of my people. I do the hiring and the firing. And let me tell you that not one single soul under my care killed Brett Slopes. That's what I'm here to find out, Lacey, Sarah answered. Sarah was determined to look like a cop, who wasn't worried about Clint Junerson being on the loose. If Junerson was somehow watching her, she had to appear professional, not emotional. I'll need to talk to every one of your employees, she continued. Andrew, it's going to be a long night, but we need statements from everyone. Get Ralph, Andy and Steve on that. You bet, 
Andrew told Sarah and then added in a low whisper. We need to call Conrad. No, Sarah begged under her breath. Andrew, let me handle this case, okay? Please. Andrew studied Sarah's strained eyes, saw something that worried him, and nodded his head. Okay, Sarah. Mum is the word for now, he promised, and hurried away to speak to Andy, Ralph, and Steve. Okay, guys, line everyone up and start getting statements. Andy, you take the clowns, Steve, you take the other performers. Ralph, you tackle the workers. Sarah felt relief touch her heart. Andrew would be true to his word. And even more, she thought, admiring the man for his professionalism and friendship, he was handling the murder the way a good cop should. Lacey, have you hired any new people recently? She asked, focusing her attention back on the woman in front of her. Lacey rubbed her chin. I picked up a married couple in Seattle before traveling north to Alaska. Howard and Charlene are both on social security and work selling the snow cones and cotton candy for me. Good people who wanted a little extra cash in their pockets. Sarah glanced over her shoulder and spotted Amanda staring at Lacey. Manford was watching Andrew call all the people standing outside into the main tent. Amanda looked at Sarah and waited. Lacey, I know I've already asked you this, but do you have any idea who might want to kill Brett Slopes? Did you see any strangers speaking with Mr. Slopes? Anything useful? Sarah knew she was fishing for crumbs, but sure hoped Lacey would mention a stranger that might match the description of Clint Junerson. Lacey shook her head no, disappointing Sarah. Ms. Garland, she said, allowing her voice to fall tired, Brett was the quietest man I ever met in my life. He only talked when he had to, and even then he only spoke a short word or two. Why, I had to pry his past out of him with a crowbar. Lacey looked around the main tent. Brett wasn't the type of man who went around looking to make a friend or two, never mind an outright enemy. Okay, Sarah said. Thank you for being honest with me, Lacey. If you don't mind, go see Chief Andrew and give him your statement. I'll be in touch. Lacey reached out and took Sarah's hand. I saw you on the television and read all about you in the newspapers and magazines. You caught a very dangerous killer and made a lot of people very proud. I nearly hit the floor when Manford told me it was Sarah Garland, the Sarah Garland who helped turn his life around. Lacey glanced around and lowered her voice. If anyone can catch the awful creature who murdered poor Brett, it'll be you. I hope you're right. Sarah told Lacey and offered a polite smile. Lacey patted her hand and walked off. As soon as Lacey walked away, Amanda rushed over to Sarah, Manford hot on her heels. Hey. Manford huffed and puffed at Amanda. I can't run as fast as you. Oh quit complaining and come on, Amanda fussed back, dragging Manford behind her. Manford nearly tripped but managed to keep up. So? Amanda asked Sarah in an anxious voice. What's the word? Brett Slopes was a drinker and a loner, Sarah explained. I could have told you that, Manford told Sarah and pulled free from Amanda. Brett never talked to anyone and spent his free time in a run-down camper drinking his nights away. I guess we better go take a look at his camper, Sarah told Manford. Lead the way. Manford watched Lacey walk up to Andrew and begin talking. Yeah, okay, Sarah, he said. This way. Follow the runt, Amanda said. Manford shot her a sour look. Ah, follow the midget, or follow the little guy. Amanda tried to soften her statement, but finally gave up. Oh, just get your little rear end moving. Manford rolled his eyes and walked off. He led Sarah and Amanda out through a back exit flap and toward a back field covered with old run-down RVs and small tents that housed all the animals. The RVs and the small tents were all bathed with bright light from the light trees parked by the generators, making the field look more like a small town than a camp full of vagabonds. This way, he said, tucked his head down against the snow and wind and began walking. Sarah and Amanda followed Manford to a 1988 Fleetwood Pace Arrow RV that was rusted, run down, and somehow amazingly still able to run. What a junk heap, Amanda complained. Okay, you two stand guard out here. I'll hurry, Sarah explained. I know it's freezing so I'll be as quick as possible. 
She grabbed some latex gloves from the inner pocket of her coat and put them on. Hurry, love, Amanda begged. The snow is falling harder, and it won't be long before our street will be snowed in. Yeah, I want to sleep in my bed tonight, Manford told Sarah and offered a warm smile. It's great to be back home with my family. Sarah smiled, patted Manford's shoulder, and climbed into the RV on quick legs. The inside of the RV, to her relief, was neat and very well organized. Yet the air smelled of sour whiskey and old cigarettes. Okay, let's see what I can find. Sarah spent the next 20 minutes conducting a general search. She found clothes, a little food, some cash, a few packs of cigarettes, an old record player and plenty of whiskey bottles. Not a single clue seemed to point to anything specific about him. This man was chosen at random, she whispered and tossed down an old country western record onto a wooden table that was badly warped. Junerson can't be connected to him. Amanda popped her head into the RV just as Sarah moved toward the exit. Anything, love? she called out through chattering teeth. Nothing, Sarah said and stepped back out into the snowy night. She looked around at all the parked RVs and shook her head. Brett Slopes was a random target. I had to make sure though, she explained. Come on. Sarah walked Amanda and Manford back to the main tent and approached Andrew. I'm going home, Andrew. There's not much more that I can do here. I'm assuming you went and checked Mr. Slopes's RV. Andrew asked. Sarah nodded her head. Clean she explained, feeling the eyes of scared circus workers digging into her face. You're in charge, Andrew. You know the ropes. I'll just be in your way tonight. No, you won't, Sarah, Andrew insisted. He looked at Amanda and Manford. You guys are important to the department, and to me. Andrew patted Manford's shoulder. We'll find the killer, he promised. Manford looked up into Andrew's caring face. I hope you do he said in a sincere voice and patted Andrew's hand. I'll get Sarah and Amanda back to the cabin for the night. Andrew looked at Sarah. Don't you want to see the body before you leave? Yeah, I guess we should, Amanda pointed out. I mean, love, don't all homicide detectives see the dead body? Not tonight, Sarah told Amanda. Andrew, we'll talk tomorrow, okay? Tonight, I don't think I can handle seeing a dead body. Sarah began to walk away and then paused. Andrew, was any note found with the body? Andrew shook his head no. Okay, bring the murder weapon by my cabin tomorrow. Andrew gave Amanda a strange look. Amanda shrugged her shoulders. Ah, sure, Sarah. First thing, he promised. Sarah gently touched her belly. She wanted life, not death. Around noon, she said, offered Andrew a professional nod and walked away. What's with her? Andrew asked Amanda in a low tone. I would have thought she would have wanted to see the body. Amanda watched Sarah leave the main tent. Maybe she's tired of death, she whispered and hurried after Sarah. Manford looked around the main tent and then got moving after them. That's right, Clint Junerson grinned, watching Sarah leave the main tent standing off in the darkness, run, run, run from the nightmare. But you'll never be able to escape the laughter of the deadly clown. Sarah, feeling a pair of deadly eyes peering into her heart, spun around and searched the icy darkness. All she saw was falling snow. I know you're out there, she whispered in a shaky, scared voice, hiding in the darkness, hidden in the snow. Chapter 3 Manford, being braver than he wanted to be, walked mittens while being watched over by Sarah and Amanda through the back door. After the dog did her business, he scrambled inside Sarah's warm cabin ahead of them and began shaking snow off his coat. I'm frozen solid. Sarah closed and locked the back door. We'll have to settle for leftover pizza tonight, guys, she explained. I'm not in the mood to do much cooking. Me neither, love, Amanda agreed. She kicked snow off her boots and then hurried to make a fresh pot of coffee. Sarah removed her coat, hung it up, and then asked Manford to go into the living room and make a warm fire. Sure you bet, Manford said, grateful to be home. Come on, girl, he told Mittens. Mittens wagged her tail and followed Manford out of the kitchen. Okay, Sarah said in a quick voice, here's the deal, Junebug. Brett Slopes was a random kill. 
Clint Junerson must have killed him to send me a message. But the problem is, no riddle was left next to the body. Why? Sarah checked her gun with skilled hands and then set the gun down on the kitchen table. I'll tell you why. I had a feeling you would, love, Amanda told Sarah as she removed her gloves, watching her best friend sit down at the kitchen table. Brett Slopes was a random target because Junerson wanted to get my attention and nothing more, Sarah explained. When he starts to kill intended victims, the riddles will start with each body. Oh love that's creepy, Amanda said and shivered all over. The insane bloke from London who tried to kill me was creepy enough, and so was his mother. Amanda got a fresh pot of coffee brewing, and then sat down at the kitchen table. So, what do we do, love? Sit here like ducks in a pond surrounded by hungry hunters? For now, Sarah nodded her head yes. For now we sit very still in this cabin with our guns close. Sarah studied the back door. Junerson is out there, Junebug. I felt him watching me at the circus. I know he's here. That's why I didn't need to see the body. I've seen how Junerson kills. Shouldn't we at least have checked out the murder weapon? Amanda asked. Andrew is going to bring an eight-inch chef's knife with a wooden brown handle to this cabin tomorrow, Sarah assured Amanda. I'll bet you a hundred bucks I'm right about the weapon. Junerson used the same type of knife to kill his victims. I doubt he's changed his tastes. Amanda tossed her wet gloves down onto the kitchen table. Sometimes I wonder, late at night when I'm lying awake, how much worse can this world get? I think of all the hurt, the pain, the misery that evil causes innocent people. I think about a stupid kid high on drugs killing a gas station clerk for a few dollars, and then I think about monsters like the back alley killer and wonder. Why? Amanda listened to the icy winds howling and screaming outside. In her mind she saw a creepy clown's face form in the wind and hiss at her. Why love, why do people kill each other? Life is so precious, so beautiful, but the monsters lurking about out there, soulless and evil, take joy in killing innocent people. I can't understand that kind of evil, and I refuse to try. Amanda thought about the case she and Sarah had been thrown into while driving through Oregon. Every monster we fought claimed to have a different reason for murder, but love, they're all identical at the core. The darkness that eats away their souls, it's a virus that doesn't change faces. Sarah looked at Amanda. I didn't know you thought about things like this, Junebug. Amanda lowered her eyes. Late at night, when my hubby is gone and I'm missing him, and the wind is howling like it is now, those ugly thoughts creep into my mind, love. I try to shoo them away, but the little buggers won't leave me alone until they've entertained an audience, namely me. Amanda raised her eyes. I can understand why you dream. I wish I had amnesia, Sarah told Amanda. I wish I had never become a cop or begun writing murder mysteries. I wish I had never created that awful snowman who now haunts me. I wish I had become a simple housewife who stayed home, baked cookies, made shopping lists, and took care of her home. Maybe back in the 50s I might have. But in today's society, where decent morals are destroyed by perverse ideals poisoning our society that was already frail to begin with. Well, I chose the only path I can, the path that hooked its claws into me long ago. You've done a lot of good. At what cost, Junebug? Sarah asked, feeling completely drained. All I want to do is get pregnant and have a child of my own. I want to build a nursery and buy tiny socks. I want to solve diaper rash, not criminal motives. I want to wipe slobber off my child's face and wonder if he or she is smiling because of gas or something else. I want to experience motherhood and grow old in this little snowy town raising my child up in the ways of the Lord." Sarah bowed her head. Sometimes I feel like Sarah in the Bible. When it's time I'll have a child, until then I pray. If it's not my time. Sarah raised her head and looked at Amanda. While I'm waiting, I don't want to fight any more monsters. But Junebug, what choice do I have? I started this and now I'm in the fight, for life. And I don't want to be, because… Sarah trailed off, looking away from her friend, afraid to voice her deepest fears. Instead, she looked up. Does any of this make sense to you? You're worried that if you do become pregnant, 
Someday a monster will come along and harm your baby, right, love? Yes, Sarah confessed with relief. Years ago, when I chose to become a cop, I worked happily for years and never thought about the consequences. And now, oh, how I want to be pregnant so desperately, but after tonight, I'm so afraid. Sarah looked at the back door. There was a time when I wasn't so afraid. There was a time when I had the courage to face the snowman. When we nearly died up at the hot springs, I was prepared to fight that snowman. When the back alley killer showed up in town, I was prepared to fight the snowman. When the mafia showed up, when we fought that corrupt FBI agent, all of our battles, June Bug, I was prepared to fight and I did fight. But now, Sarah touched her soft belly. I want to throw in the towel and focus only on having a baby. No more novels to write, no more monsters to fight. In time, love, Amanda promised. In time, Sarah whispered. She looked at Amanda. It may sound silly, June Bug, but during the clown act at the circus tonight, I thought about our coffee shop. Why? Amanda asked. We were open for business today, before we closed up and went to the circus. We had swell business too, love. Nothing to worry about there, right? I know, Sarah actually smiled. It was so nice to open the coffee shop and have a normal day. And that's what I was thinking about, normalcy. Sarah tossed her right thumb toward the phone. Pete is trained to understand the violence hiding in the dark corners of the world. The darkness hiding in the closets is his reality as normal. For a time, the darkness hiding in the closet was my normal too, even after I arrived in Snow Falls. But when does it stop, Junebug? At what point do we say enough? I've learned that if we say enough, the killers win, love, Amanda answered in a voice that shocked Sarah. I wish it weren't so, but it is. Amanda pointed at Sarah's belly. Even if you are blessed to have a sweet baby, love, the monsters aren't going away. Amanda lowered her hand. Highways, airports, train stations, technology, medicine, the monsters of this world have the same privileges as we do. They drive cars, work jobs, drink coffee, eat at restaurants, get on the internet, read books, shop in stores, all while wearing a human face over the face of a monster. They're out there, lurking about, being trained by a society, love, that craves violent movies, violent music, violent television shows. People are conditioned to accept the culture of death that surrounds them. And the monsters love it. They lurk about, free as a bird, and attack with ease. And what happens when they're caught? The media has a field day, while the justice system fails to issue real justice. Sure, back in the day, as you Yanks say, justice was carried out with a firm hand. Back in the cowboy days, you didn't have all the nonsense and red tape you do today. And that love is why we can't give up. If the only good cowboys and cowgirls that remain give up the fight, well, it's all over. Goodbye tea and cookies. Goodbye sweet nurseries and after chats with our dearest friends. Sarah stared into Amanda's bright eyes and with sadness. I don't want to be a cowgirl anymore, love. I just want to be a mommy. But you can't just be a mommy, love. Amanda pointed toward the back door. There's a killer out there, and we're sitting inside this warm kitchen. The killer is free and we're trapped. Do you see, love? Do you see why we can't give up? Amanda lowered her hand. I was very scared when we drove back to the circus, and I'm still very scared, love. But deep down inside of my heart, I see millions of sweet unborn babies waiting to be born. If I give up, what will become of them? What kind of world will they live in? Oh, I know I'm just a silly Brit who eats too much American junk food, but I would like to think the small ripples I make in the pond matter. It does matter, you do matter, Junebug, Sarah promised. And so do you, love. Amanda reached across the table and patted Sarah's hands. Honey, whether we live or die, tomorrow will come, and that means the good and the bad will arrive with it. Sarah stared into Amanda's eyes and found comfort, a desperately needed comfort. What you're trying to tell me is that whether I become a mommy or not, the fight will continue. Amanda nodded her head. Can I just run far, far away? The boxing ring is too big to escape from, love. Tell me about it. Sarah drew in a deep breath and steadied her mind. That's it. Steady on, my friend. 
We have to build the world we want to live in. We have to defend it against all the darkness, Amanda said as gently as she knew how. Okay, Junebug, Sarah said. She sat up straighter in her chair. I better stop fussing and get my cop hat back on and start acting like a big girl again. Sarah stood up, walked to the kitchen phone and called Pete, filled with a new determination. When he answered the phone, Sarah dove right in. Pete, I talked to Lacey Armington, the owner of the circus. She gave me a few breadcrumbs concerning Brett Slopes. Pete shoved warm Chinese noodles into his mouth with a fork. Maybe we got the same info. Let me run it by you, Slopes is a vet. No arrest record, attended a few on meetings after his wife divorced him. He was hired by the circus about two years ago. Sound about right? Yeah, it does. Ms. Armington said Brett Slopes was a loner, barely spoke to anyone, and stuck to himself. Mr. Slopes's death was a message to you and me, and nothing more, Pete nodded his head and tossed down his fork. The monster on my end got my attention, about half an hour ago. Sarah shook her head. Who, Pete? A homeless woman. I'm still waiting for a name, Pete explained. The Chinese boy who delivered my dinner found her body outside on the sidewalk. I didn't want to stake out Kelly Junerson on an empty belly. Pete glanced down at his box of Chinese food. The usual crew is outside, picking through the crime scene. I decided it was time to eat. Any note left with the body? Nope. Just the same old chef's knife, Pete explained. Looks like our killers have gotten our attention, kiddo. Now the only question is, who is next? Sarah asked. Pete grabbed his cigar. I'm heading out the door in about 10 minutes, kiddo. I'll be at the truck stop if you need me. In the meantime, sit tight and play it smart. We understand the rules of the game and both know that the killers have the upper hand right now. All we can do is wait for the next body, next phone call, next anything. I'm back at my cabin, Sarah assured Pete. I have Amanda and Manford with me. Good. Stay put, Pete advised Sarah. He lit his cigar with a match, stood up, tossed on an old gray hat, and looked around for his gray overcoat. Junerson isn't stupid, kiddo. Out of all the killers we've tangled with, I put him on my top ten list as being the most dangerous. He was tied with the Sandy Beach Killer, but moved up the list after I remembered how the Sandy Beach Killer made a rookie mistake, which allowed us to catch her. Junerson isn't going to make a rookie mistake. Yeah, Pete, Clint Junerson isn't stupid, just deadly. Sarah saw Manford walk back into the kitchen with mittens at his side. Hey, Pete, check the prison records and see. Having Junerson's prison visitations checked as we speak, kiddo. Charlie down at the station, is doing me a favor. He owes me for saving his butt more than once. Charlie is a very clumsy cop, Sarah pointed out, wincing. Yeah, poor Charlie is liable to shoot his foot off someday. Listen, Pete, check the members of the parole board. And the judge and Junerson's lawyer. I know, kiddo. I'm on it, Pete assured Sarah. I'm the teacher, remember? Sarah felt her cheeks turn red. Sorry, Pete. I didn't mean to step on your toes. Pete grinned. Sure you did. You always liked stepping on my toes, kiddo. That's what makes you special. Now let me finish my food and get out of here. Detective Mallory is outside, and you know I can't stand that jerk. Yeah, you better get going before there's another murder, Sarah told Pete. I'll call you in a bit. Sarah hung up the phone and looked at Manford. Fire all set. All set, Manford told Sarah and then went to pour himself a cup of coffee. I'm sure hungry. I'll warm up the pizza, Amanda said. I could use a bite myself. Sarah watched Mittens return to her bed. Manford pour himself a cup of coffee and Amanda pull a box of cheese pizza from the refrigerator. For a moment, just a moment, the night felt normal. But then the hideous snowman Sarah had created slithered into her mind. The clown is loose, Sarah, loose in the snow, and last time he nearly got you. Oh yes, you didn't tell Amanda that, did you? Go away, Sarah begged under her breath. I'm not afraid. Out in the snow, Clint Junerson removed his scary mask, 
tossed it into a black suitcase and waited for his girlfriend to arrive back at the RV they traveled in. It was nice to be dating a circus woman who didn't tell anyone her business. As far as anyone working at the circus knew, Clint was just an unseen love interest to some woman who sold refreshments. And that kind of dark, unsuspecting anonymity was exactly what he liked best. Pete drove into the parking lot of a run-down truck stop filled with semi-trucks of all colors lined up in neat rows. The truck stop looked like something out of an old 70s horror movie, sitting way out on a deserted piece of land east of Los Angeles. Pete eased his 1988 gray Bonneville down the row of semi-trucks and parked beside the last truck. It would have to be raining, he fussed, tossed his cigar into the dashboard ashtray, got out of the car and walked to the end of the truck he had parked beside and glanced at the truck stop. The building was downright creepy. Okay Kelly, you have 20 minutes before your shift starts, Pete said, checking his watch. He hitched his overcoat up against the threatening rain and waited. It's a rainy night in Georgia, he began to hum while a heavy rain began to fall from a dark sky. Ten minutes later, a woman riding a Honda Nighthawk motorcycle that was mostly pieced together from junk parts rode up to the front of the truck stop and parked. What a dive, the woman fussed under her breath, spit a wet cigarette out of her mouth, climbed off the motorcycle and looked around the wet night, unaware that Pete was watching her. Pete removed a small black field camera that had cost him a pretty penny, zoomed in on the woman's face and snapped a few photos. Jenny Junerson had no idea her picture was being taken. If she had known someone was going to snap a few shots of her, she might have brushed and sprayed out her stringy blonde hair and made sure her brown waitress uniform had been ironed instead of all wrinkled up, maybe a dab of makeup and a smile, but what did Kelly have to smile about? She was living a ruined life. Who cared about her? So you're finally at work? Pete whispered and shook his head. This stakeout was proving far easier than he had anticipated. Kelly shrugged rainwater off the leather jacket she was wearing, coughed, let out a couple of sneezes, and then walked inside. Sure she had been sick and riding her bike in the rain wasn't smart, but she probably didn't have any other choice, Pete reflected. On the other hand, he saw Kelly's cold to be a confirmation that her boss had been telling the truth. So she didn't send me the pie or kill that homeless woman, he said and glanced around. Maybe he was being watched, who knew? Eyes were everywhere. Let's have a chat, shall we? Pete left his secure position and made his way across a wet parking lot. He stopped at a set of wooden doors that looked like they were ready to fall apart, prepared himself to be bombarded by the smell of grease, cigarette smoke and trucker music, and walked inside. The large, dimly lit dining room had an old brown linoleum floor and ugly stained gray walls plastered with weather-beaten photos of truckers, country singers and D-list actors. The diner was full of truckers either eating at the tables, playing pool, or just hanging out at a long wooden counter, passing the time drinking stale coffee and eating powdery sickly-looking donuts. He spotted Kelly standing behind the front counter talking to a short, plump woman smoking a cigarette. I doubt she even knows my face, Pete whispered, and decided to approach the counter and act like a tired trucker. Coffee, he called out and sat down on a wooden stool. Just a minute, Kelly barked. Listen, May, that's not right. I know I missed two nights of work, but I was sick. I'm here now. The short woman blew smoke from her mouth in a way that told Pete she had no warm personal feelings toward Kelly whatsoever. Listen, honey, you've missed more than just two nights of work. Last month you missed a full week. The boss ain't happy. He's cutting your hours until you can start making your days. After that, who knows? Maybe the boss will raise your hours back up. Kelly hit the back of the counter with a hard fist. You can tell that slime to jump off a cliff. I quit, she yelled and stormed out of the truck stop, dropping a wrinkled apron behind her as she left. Pete eased off the stool and followed Kelly outside. He paused at the exit and pulled out a cigar end, pretending to look for matches. Tough night, he asked, watching Kelly kick her motorcycle in the rain. Huh. Kelly turned around and spotted Pete standing beside her. Hey mister, take a hike, okay? Pete shoved his hands into the pockets of his overcoat. I wish I could, but it seems that your brother is back in action. Kelly stared at Pete like the man was utterly insane. My brother? 
What are you talking about? That loser is in prison. He's been paroled. Kelly froze. Paroled, she asked as fear gripped her voice. Hey, that's not funny, man. Neither is being 30 and working a dead-end waitress job, Pete told Kelly. He eyed the diner door behind him. Or quitting one, I guess. Yeah, I know all about Kelly Junerson. What are you, a cop? Yeah, that's it, you're a cop. Kelly raised a shaky finger at Pete as the rain soaked her hair. Get away from me, do you hear me, she snapped. I don't talk to cops. Pete didn't see a rodeo riding woman standing before him. Kelly Junerson was a broken, run-down horse that would never see her glory days again. It was clear that alcohol had taken over her life. A spatter of broken blood vessels reddened her nose, her cheeks and the whites of her eyes. Your brother has killed again, Kelly. And it seems he's not working alone this time. Maybe he wasn't working alone last time either. You know anything about that? Kelly eased back toward her motorcycle. Listen. I've got to get out of here, she said, feeling panic grip her voice. If what you say is true, then I've got to run. Kelly climbed onto the motorcycle, preparing to kick the starter pedal down. Just stay away from me, cop. What my brother does ain't any of my business, do you hear? Pete watched Kelly try to start her motorcycle. The motor failed to kick on, no matter how vehemently she slammed the starter pedal down with her soaked, cheap sneakers. You're flooding it. I know how to start this stupid bike. Kelly yelled. Pete shrugged his shoulders and looked around at the rain. Mind telling me why you're scared of your own brother, he asked. I ain't scared of no one, Kelly said in an angry voice as she worked on the motorcycle. Stupid bike. You flooded it. I didn't flood my bike. Kelly insisted and then, to Pete's relief, just lowered her head and gave up. Okay, maybe I did. What's it to you? She angrily swiped a lock of limp, wet hair off her forehead. Pete shrugged his shoulders again. Nothing, he answered in an honest voice. Kelly, I couldn't care two cents about you. Why? Because you don't care two cents about anyone but yourself. You're the type of woman who blames the world for all of her problems and goes around hating everyone. Yeah, I know you're kind. Kelly shot Pete a pair of sour eyes. Don't lecture me. I don't intend to, Pete told Kelly. All I want to know is why you're scared. Has your brother Clint threatened you? Look, Kelly snapped, my brother is a real psycho, okay? Him and that girlfriend of his, they're crazies, you know? Girlfriend? Pete asked. Kelly looked down at her hands and pressed her lips together, regretting her words. Pete quickly reached into his back pocket and pulled out a wallet that was about ready to fall apart. Look, I've got $316 in my wallet. It's all yours if you talk to me. My rent is more than that and it's due, Kelly told Pete. She eyed the wallet. I need some food too. I'm not made of money, girl. Either take the money and talk or take a hike. Kelly eyed the wallet. Okay, okay, she said giving in. You're paying me a week's wage, good enough. Give me the money and we'll talk. We'll talk first. Kelly scowled. Look, cop, all I know is that my brother killed some people and his little girlfriend, Miss Fancy Pants, helped him. Miss Fancy Pants? Pete asked. Yeah, Kelly said and shook her head in disgust. Clint bragged to me about her, bragged about dating some fancy lawyer who found him charming. Why? Who knows? Clint used to work as a stupid circus clown, for crying out loud. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out why some lawyer wanted to romance my loser brother. Name? Kelly shrugged her shoulders. Never got a name, just a face, and that was only a one-time deal. But I have to say, Kelly admitted, Miss Fancy Pants is a pretty face. But. Kelly paused. But what? Pete pressed. Talk to me, Kelly. I don't know, Kelly snapped. I met the woman for a few seconds at the beach. She just seemed odd, okay. Odd? How? Miss Fancy Pants gave me the creeps, okay? Kelly admitted. Now pay up. Why are you so scared? Pete demanded. Tell me. Maybe I can help you. 
Kelly looked around with worry creasing her rough face. Look, cop, she said, lowering her voice, when Clint started killing those people he promised to kill me unless I helped him. How? He never said how, Kelly snapped. I refused to help him, so he never gave details, okay? But. But what? Kelly kept her eyes on the rain, and then began studying the parked semi-trucks. Clint was going to kill me, cop. I knew it, and he knew it. Miss Fancy Pants was going to have him kill me. So I followed him one night. I, Kelly locked her eyes on a green semi-truck. I watched him kill a woman, he was wearing a really creepy clown mask, real horror movie stuff. You didn't tell the police? Pete asked, knowing the answer. He just wanted to press Kelly. No way, cop, Kelly insisted. I had to watch my own back. So you know what I did? You set your brother up? Kelly pulled her eyes away from the semi-truck and looked at Pete. How did you know? Because I was the detective in charge of the murders, Kelly. I was the one who received an anonymous call that the knife that killed Brandy Matterson was hidden in your brother's circus trailer. I should have known, Kelly said in a sharp voice. You planted the knife, didn't you? Hey, what choice did I have? Kelly asked. I was next on the list. And before you ask me how I knew, let me tell you, a sister knows her brother, okay? I read what was in my brother's eyes. When I refused to help him, he changed. But I knew it was Miss Fancy Pants changing him. Whoever this woman is, she must be powerful. Your brother only spent a little over ten years behind bars. Kelly shrugged her shoulders. All Clint told me was that she was a lawyer. Pete opened his wallet and handed Kelly all of his money. Your brother is out to kill me, Kelly, he said without mentioning Sarah. He'll probably come for you, too. He's out for revenge, and this lawyer woman is probably on his team again. Kelly took the money from Pete and shoved it deep in her jeans pocket. That's why I'm leaving town, cop. Before you leave, maybe you can tell me what this lawyer woman looked like? Pete asked. Kelly hesitated and then nodded her head. Pete seemed like an honest guy. Why give him a hard time? So what if he was a cop? Not all cops were bad. Real pretty looked Hispanic, long black hair, real pretty face. She was wearing a brown leather jacket the day I saw her, and these really stylish boots. I remember the boots, because I had seen a similar pair that I had wanted but couldn't afford. Kelly lowered her eyes and stared at the handlebars. I've let the bottle really destroy my life, she confessed. I used to ride the rodeo circuit, you know. Used to have custom boots made for me every year. I know, Pete told Kelly. I also know why you were kicked out. Kelly kept her eyes low. I was drunk when I drugged all the horses, okay? I know it was wrong but I needed. My boss was ready to kin me and I thought if I made a real name for myself. Kelly shook her head. Know why I really drink, she asked Pete. To forget? You guessed it right, Kelly nodded her head. I went into the rodeo to escape a horrible childhood and some really bad teenage years. Riding horses was all I had ever been good at, and the rodeo become home. But you can't escape your problems. Not really. Pete reached out and put a caring hand on Kelly's shoulder. It's never too late, Kelly. Kelly raised her eyes. It is for me, she said. I'm washed out, cop. Kelly shrugged off Pete's hand, finally got her bike started and looked at Pete. My old man was dangerous. It's not just Miss Fancy Pants calling the shots, you know. I think my father is to blame for turning Clint into the monster he's become, she said and then shook her head as if regretting her words once more. Then she revved the engine and sped away into the rainy night before Pete could say another word. Pete watched Kelly vanish into the rain and then walked back to his car. Okay, he said, looking around as he walked through the rain. Kelly Junerson is in the clear. Now I have to track down a pretty Hispanic lawyer who has a thing for killers and who is a killer herself. Pete reached his car, climbed inside, and then called Sarah. Hey, kiddo, Kelly Junerson is in the clear. Sarah glanced over at Amanda and Manford. Both of her dear friends were eating pizza. Are you sure? 
I just got through chewing the fat with her. Yeah, I'm sure. Pete grabbed his cigar and began telling Sarah about the conversation he had with Kelly. My next step is to track down this Miss Fancy Pants, he said, and debated on whether he wanted to light his cigar or not. I guess we owe Kelly a bit of gratitude. If she hadn't stepped in, we would have never caught Clint Junerson the first time around, Sarah told Pete in a miserable voice. She locked her eyes on the back door. Nice detective work, Pete. You still have the touch. And so do you, kiddo, Pete assured Sarah. Look, I know you want a baby and I'm excited for that. But listen to me, kiddo, we're cops and we have cop work to do. You need to clear your mind and start thinking like a cop and brush the emotional cobwebs aside for a while. You're right, Pete. Sarah studied the back door. She saw Pete staking out the truck stop like a real cop, and then saw herself hiding inside her safe kitchen feeling scared and tired. Anger struck her heart. It's time to start being a cop again, she said. Yes, I want a baby more than anything, but right now there's a killer in my town, and I'm going to catch him. Pete nodded his head. Welcome back, kiddo, he said and lit his cigar with a match. As he did, Emilia Lopez watched a bunch of useless cops buzzing around Pete's office building with careful eyes. Clint was in charge of Sarah Garland and she was in charge of Pete. Once both cops were properly dealt with, the killing spree would truly start. Chapter 4 Andrew placed a very sharp chef's knife encased in a plastic evidence bag on Sarah's kitchen table. Normal wooden handle, nothing special as far as I can see, he said in a voice roughened from the frigid morning. His eyes wandered over to the coffee pot. You mind? Of course not, Sarah told Andrew staring at the knife. Coffee is fresh. Creamer is in the fridge. Andrew tossed off a thick brown coat covered with snow and hung it up before glancing around the kitchen in puzzlement. Where are Amanda and Manford, he asked. It's almost noon. Manford is in his bedroom catching up on some sleep, Sarah explained. Amanda is in my bedroom talking to her husband on the phone. Sarah studied the chef's knife with skilled eyes. Of course, deep inside her heart she wanted to run far, far away from the nightmare that was quickly engulfing her life, but she was a cop and cops didn't run, not the good cops at least. I spoke with Conrad this morning, she told Andrew. I didn't tell him anything. Andrew grabbed a brown coffee mug. Mum is the word, detective he promised and began filling the coffee mug with fresh, hot coffee. I believe friends should always trust each other, okay? Thank you, Andrew, a chief. Sarah, being chief of police doesn't make me special. I wear a silly old title that doesn't make me worse or better than I am. Andrew walked back to the kitchen table. In Snow Falls we're all alone, and folks have to watch each other's backs. We can't depend on help this far out. The state police sure don't rush out here to help us, that's for sure. We're on our own, Sarah agreed. She stepped away from the kitchen table and poured a cup of coffee for herself. Has Dr. Downing found anything helpful? Andrew shook his head. Nope, he told Sarah. No signs of a struggle, no other physical injuries other than the knife wound. Whoever killed Mr. Slopes must have snuck up behind him. Sarah took a sip of her coffee and looked at Andrew. It was time to tell Andrew the truth. Andrew, we're friends and I respect you. Conrad respects you. Andrew gave Sarah a confused look. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, Sarah, the feeling is mutual, you guys know that. Melinda and I think the world of you and Conrad. Then please don't get angry with me, Sarah begged. Angry? Andrew, I know who killed Brett Slopes. I've known since last night but I had to be certain. Sarah nodded at the kitchen table. Sit down, chief, and let me fill you in. Andrew nodded his head and sat down. Okay, detective, he said, dismissing his personal feelings and focusing entirely on the case at hand. Who is the killer and where do we stand? The killer is a man named Clint Junerson. However, it seems he's not working alone this time. Sarah pulled up a seat at the kitchen table. Clint Junerson was known as the clown killer, she continued, and thoroughly explained the case she and Pete had tangled with concerning Clint Junerson. If it hadn't been for his sister's anonymous tip, Pete and I would have never captured Clint Junerson. 
Sarah took a sip of coffee. Pete managed to track down Kelly Junerson last night and confirmed she's not the second killer. Andrew rubbed his chin. So Pete is dealing with a second killer? Sarah nodded her head yes. And we're dealing with a killer, excuse me, two killers who carried out two random killings to, to send out a deadly message? That's the way it seems. But why? And why now? Andrew asked. Well, Sarah said, fighting the last of the sleepy blues out of her mind, my theory is that Clint Junerson and his sidekick plan to go on a killing spree again and want two pesky cops out of the way. Pete and I know his methods very, very well. We'd be the first to identify him, so he wants us gone. I know that sounds pretty cut and dry but, Sarah put down her coffee, for now that's all I can come up with. This is serious business, Sarah. Andrew stood up after taking a last long sip of coffee. Junerson may strike a private citizen next. Andrew rubbed the back of his neck with worried hands. I'm not so sure, Sarah explained. Andrew, Clint Junerson could have killed anyone but he chose to focus on the circus. He wants me to know he's around and that the circus will be his base of operation. Sarah picked her coffee mug back up. I spent half the night sitting in this kitchen thinking about Clint Junerson, remembering, I even had Pete email me his old case file. Sarah pointed to the living room. I have a print out of the file, sitting on the desk in the living room. Will you run and get it for me? Sure. Andrew rushed off, found the papers, and hurried back to the kitchen. Here it is. That's your copy, Sarah explained. She stood up and stretched her back. Andrew, look at page four. Andrew flipped through the papers he was holding. Clint Junerson attended Harvard Law. He was a prominent law student before he was banned for demonstrating and disrupting the campus. He was demonstrating in favor of some very radical ideas, the kind that make communism look like a walk in the park. Andrew read through the report. Says here he became a clown therapist after Harvard gave him the boot. Clint Junerson relocated to the Los Angeles area, Sarah confirmed. He did become a clown therapist. I didn't even know that was a thing. But why would he choose that kind of profession? I'm not sure, Sarah confessed. Junerson expressed a poisonous ideal in his demonstrations. He had a desire to alter the justice system into some kind of system controlled by a four-man court that operated on a disciplinary merit system. Strike one and you get 20 years in prison, no questions asked, no matter what the crime. Strike two, you get 40 years, no questions asked, no matter the crime, parking ticket or murder. Strike three, you get a rope around your neck. Sarah looked down at her coffee mug. This system of justice would instill fear. It's a government-controlled society that makes North Korea look like a beacon of liberty and hope. Yeah, my cousins have a son who is being brainwashed by a college right now, Andrew told Sarah in a disgusted voice. He's being taught how to hate his own family, he gets offended by everything and fights for ideas that are contrary to the American Constitution, contrary to all freedom for that matter. Andrew sat back down. Last summer the kid, well he's 21, came up for a visit with his parents. It took less than 20 minutes to kick him out of my house. You seem like the patient kind, Andrew. This young man must have said something very awful for you to lose your temper in such a way. Oh he did, Andrew promised Sarah. He tossed down the report he was holding and took a sip of coffee. In less than 20 minutes I was called a racist pig that defended the rights of fascist corporations that enslave free-thinking minds trapped in a prejudiced land that minimizes progressive mental growth or some such nonsense. Andrew rolled his eyes. I didn't understand all the garbage that brat threw at me, but the words racist pig were enough to make me lose my temper. That's terrible. A nice kid like that coming up with such horrible words is just evidence that society is decaying, fast. Yep, Andrew nodded his head in agreement. That's why I live in Alaska, in this little town with my family. The states south of us are like overflowing toilets. Alaska is still free, well the land is still free. There's too much wild land up here for the government to control. I know a few men who walked into the wilderness and vanished. Every so often one of them will pop up in snowfalls for some supplies, 
and vanish again. Where? Who knows? Alaska is too vast for the crooks and criminals wearing suits to control. Up here the people control the land, not the government. And that's just the way I like it. Sarah thought of Los Angeles. The only place she felt free, really free, while living in sunny Los Angeles was at the beach next to the waves, next to an ocean no man would ever be able to tame. Under the waves lay a mysterious world that was alien to mankind, only seen through the eyes of scuba divers who could only swim down so deep, or through the eyes of submarines or robotic submersibles. The oceans were wild, vicious, mysterious, deep and unknown, an uncharted land untouched by the footprints of man, traveled by a beautiful sea life that would never fall prey to a decaying world. I feel free living in Alaska. When Conrad and I visit the old cabin way back in the woods, it feels like we're in a completely different world. Andrew finished off his coffee. I know Snow Falls isn't an exciting town. We have O'Malley's department store, the diner, your coffee shop, a few other little shops, the hospital, there's not much here. But let me tell you Sarah, besides all the cold and snow, there's no better place to raise a family. Andrew put down his coffee mug. Once you pass Fairbanks, that's it, you're on your own up here. And you know what, Sarah? Andrew lifted up the report Sarah had printed off for him, that's fine with me. I'd rather tangle with a few hungry bears than the savages living down in the states south of me. A vision of overcrowded freeways blaring with car horns and consumed with exhaust filled Sarah's mind. She saw cars crammed with impatient businessmen hurrying to get to their offices, old men and women who should have retired from driving ages ago bratty teenagers listening to loud music while talking on cell phones, soccer moms rushing their children to school, and masses of people busy running here and there. Then she saw a few cars begin to glow red. Inside the cars she spotted what appeared to be normal people, but then the faces on the people began to melt and murderous monsters shone through. I brought these monsters to Snow Falls, she whispered. What? Andrew asked. I brought monsters to Snow Falls, Sarah told Andrew. Clint Junerson is here because of me. Andrew simply shrugged his shoulders. Sarah, you can run thousands of miles, but a hungry bear, if it's hungry enough, will just keep on tracking you down. Snow Falls may not be Los Angeles, but I still lock my doors at night. Why? Because people are everywhere, and you just can't tell who is who anymore. Just yesterday, my wife told me about a woman in a little town in Kentucky who walked into a grocery store and was stabbed to death by an employee who was mad at his boss. If I remember correctly, the town this poor woman was killed in was about the size of Snow Falls. Sarah appreciated Andrew lifting the guilt off her shoulders. Before she could say thanks, Amanda walked into the kitchen. Well, she asked, happy for a change of subject. Amanda walked over to the kitchen counter and poured herself a cup of coffee. I'm wearing a new green dress and my husband's favorite white cashmere sweater. I look lovely, even in the face of danger. But does my hubby care, she complained. No. His mean old daddy has convinced him to stay in London for two more weeks. Two weeks? Sarah gasped. June bug that's longer than. I know, I know, Amanda griped. She turned around and pointed at the dark brown dress Sarah had chosen to wear for the day. No offense, love, but you look like a candy bar. Good enough to eat, not that your husband would know it. A uh, thanks? Sarah told Amanda in a pained voice. My point is, love, that if Conrad were here, he would agree with me. Conrad is usually here, well, most of the time. My hubby. Amanda snatched up her coffee mug with an angry hand. I could wear a dress that makes me look like a movie star and it would be years before my hubby would even be around to care. I'm sorry, Junebug. Oh, don't be, Amanda told Sarah with a sigh. She walked to the kitchen table and sat down. My hubby and I have been married enough years to tangle with more than a few storms. I know he's tending to a man who despises me, but the man is his daddy and I have to respect that. Someday that old piece of toast is going to dry up, and then my hubby will be home full time again. Andrew respected Amanda's attitude. Maybe it's better that your husband is away, he said, and nodded his eyes at the report sitting on the table. We have a killer to catch. Don't I know it, Amanda sighed. 
I barely slept a wink last night. I keep seeing scary clown faces in Sarah's bedroom window. Manfred that trickster claimed the guest bedroom, so I was forced to sleep with my dear old pal who, no offense love, has a tendency to snore. Me? Sarah asked. Junebug, you're the one that snores. Not as bad as Conrad. Well that's true, Sarah grinned. Conrad does have a tendency to snore. But it's not too bad. Are you kidding? It's enough to make a poor woman wear earmuffs over her head, Amanda complained. Love, I don't understand how you get any sleep. Earmuffs, Sarah told Amanda and allowed a tired smile to touch her lips. I have a supply of earmuffs. My wife snores, Andrew confessed. Some nights she snores so bad I have to get up and go sleep on the couch. I sleep on the couch sometimes, Sarah told Andrew. Doesn't really help. Sarah looked down at her coffee. For a brief second the morning felt normal again, blessedly normal. Outside a heavy snow was falling, an icy wind was crying and the town of Snow Falls was fully awake. Sarah saw herself preparing to go spend the day at O'Malley's with Amanda, shopping until they dropped and then grabbing a warm bite to eat at the diner. But then a hideous face appeared in her mind and grinned at her. I'm still here Sarah, still here, a vicious snowman hissed. Okay, Sarah said, feeling the normalcy of the morning shattering into a dark nightmare, back to the case. Andrew, how is the town taking the murder? I haven't made the details of the murder public yet, Andrew told Sarah. I think it's better that way, at least for now. I mean, I'm not trying to keep folks in the dark, but I don't see the sense in spooking anyone. We know who the killer is, and you seem to think this guy is going to stay focused on the circus, right? For now, Sarah nodded her head. So for now we play silent cops, Andrew pointed out. Snow Falls is full of thick-skinned people who can handle a lot, but for now there's no sense in disrupting the town. Amanda looked at Sarah with worried eyes. Ah, love, any idea how we're going to catch Clint Junerson yet? Sarah shook her head no. I haven't got a clue. Clint Junerson stepped out of a run-down RV, wearing a thick gray ski coat and a rugged pair of blue jeans. Squinting into the icy wind, his features were handsome and rugged and normal. He glanced down at a pair of brown work boots keeping the cold at bay, and then pulled down his muffler hat snugly over his stylish blonde hair. He was a 36-year-old man, who was in fit condition and ready to kill. Beautiful morning, he grinned and slowly walked his eyes around. The grounds were silent and white and chilly as the soul inside him. Circus people minded their own business, well, those who had sense to them. No one paid Clint any mind, that was the way of the circus. Circus people for the most part were loners, semi-legal migrants working for peanuts, performers hungry for fame, or just plain losers, drifters and vagabonds who couldn't hold down a real job. Lacey's circus, although flashy on the outside, was full of drunks and shady characters, people who kept their noses to the ground in case of trouble. He sneered at the whole, sorry lot of them. He called back over his shoulder into the RV, I'll be back later. Amy Holtzdale, a 32-year-old woman who was addicted to pain pills, raised her head up off a flimsy wooden table and waved at Clint. Bring back some milk, huh? Clint turned and studied Amy. The woman looked like a broken-down horse. Her once beautiful face was creased with ugly lines from the hardships of opiates. Clint looked into a pair of saggy eyes, and then glanced down at droopy lips that would never know the smile of real love. Next, he examined a head full of ratty blonde hair that had maybe once been silky and beautiful decades ago in high school. Anything else? Amy shook her head. Just milk, she said in a worn-down voice and dropped her head again. I need milk. Clint grinned. Amy was the perfect puppet. Yes, dear, he said, closed the door to the RV and began walking through thick snow. Let it snow, he whispered, enjoying the heavy falling snow and icy winds. Clint turned north, deliberately staying away from Lacey's fifth-wheel RV and walked into the main circus tent. No one had cleared the fairgrounds of snow, rendering all the RVs helpless. But Clint wasn't helpless. He had moved his motorcycle into the main tent after the circus had died down and everyone had fallen asleep. He retrieved the motorcycle from behind the wooden bleachers and looked around. The tent was silent. No witnesses. Perfect. 
Clint pushed the motorcycle through the main entrance, looked to his left and right, nodded his head, and with much effort managed to get the motorcycle out onto the front road. A plow had scraped the front road, but the heavy falling snow was quickly throwing drifts back into the back two-lane blacktop. Clint wasn't worried. A plow, at least from what Amy had heard from Lacey, would come through every hour, compliments of Snow Falls, Alaska. Let's go for a ride. Clint jumped onto the motorcycle and brought it to life, certain that the screaming winds would disguise the engine. He slowly drove away toward town. Sarah Garland will be unable to recognize me, he chuckled, keeping to a slow pace. He despised motorcycle helmets and didn't have any desire to have the wind rip his muffler hat off. Motorcycle helmets messed up his hair, the muffler hat wasn't much better, but in cold weather a man had to put style aside and allow common sense to come into play. I'll take a look around town again and double-check my plan. Clint drove into Snow Falls and eased past the diner. The diner was busy with the lunch crowd. Tire trucks covered with snow lined the main street. People who were mostly dressed like Clint were either sitting in the diner or entering or leaving one of the stores resting on the main street or walking toward one of the snow-covered trucks. Not a single person noticed Clint. He smiled coolly. Clint eased down the street, turned right and carefully rolled down to the alley behind all the main stores, including Sarah's coffee shop. He drove the motorcycle into the alley and parked. The alley was deserted. All the action was out on the front street. Let's get to work, Clint whispered in a dry, colorless voice. He jumped off the motorcycle, and on legs that any killer would envy, jogged up to the back door to Sarah's coffee shop. Without wasting a second he reached into the inside pocket of his coat, pulled out a sleek, deadly little lock-picking device, and started to work the lock. But instead of entering through the back door, Clint nodded his head, replaced the device in his pocket, and looked around at the pristine snow. Okay Sarah, tonight you get present number two. Satisfied that he could pick the lock without any trouble, Clint slowly began walking up the alley, studying the back of each store with eyes filled with murderous creativity. I'll cut the power, he whispered. Then I'll put the body in your store, Sarah Garland. Only this time I'll leave a riddle. Clint reached the end of the alley and then turned back. With each step he memorized every inch of the alley and the design of each store. Too easy, no challenge at all. Clint climbed back on the motorcycle and drove out of the alley. He eased back through town and then aimed the motorcycle at the local grocery store. The grocery store, to his delight, was mostly empty. He parked in a parking lot filled with snow drifts and looked around. You thought you could hide from me, didn't you, Sarah? I found you. I found a circus visiting your town. Why do you make this so easy? Clint locked his eyes on a rectangular green building that was home to Mr. Fleischmann's grocery store. I found your cozy hiding spot, Sarah Garland. And now, I'm going to turn your hiding spot into a nightmare. Clint jumped off the motorcycle and walked into the grocery store. A pretty black-haired girl stood at an old-fashioned checkout counter, reading a magazine. You look bored, Clint called out in a friendly voice. You should be working. Lisa Mills turned and saw a handsome man remove a muffler hat from his head. He looked almost like a young Robert Redford. Oh, slow morning, she said and watched him run a hand through his stylish blonde hair. Lisa didn't recognize the man, but so what? The guy was handsome. And although she wasn't a beauty queen, Lisa was still 21 and knew her face was pretty enough, even if she was working a dead-end job at her uncle's grocery store. She tossed the magazine down and smoothed down the pink sweater she was wearing under her green apron. We have a special running today. Oh. Clint asked. He grabbed a vintage grocery cart and rolled it over to Lisa. I'm all ears, he said and flashed a charming smile. Lisa smiled back. Ice cream is buy one, get one half off, and coffee is buy one, get one half off, and bread is buy one, get one half off, she said, remembering the specials. Clint nodded his head, pretending to appear impressed. I see he said and slowly checked the interior of the grocery store. It made him feel as if he had walked back through time and entered the forties. Old hardwood floors creaked underfoot, green wooden walls all around covered with wooden cutouts of fruits, canned goods, milk bottles and vegetables. 
the air smelled of wood smoke and pine from an old wood-burning stove, sitting close to a small work office. I only need milk today. Oh, milk is over there. Lisa pointed toward the dairy department. He smiled and began to walk away, knowing full well he had found his next victim. He knew that surely Sarah would expect him to keep playing at the circus. That's why he had killed Brett Slopes. However, Clint had no intention of allowing Sarah to catch her footing. He had to keep her on her toes. Clint gathered a gallon of milk and returned to Lisa's check stand. Your boyfriend must be very jealous, he said, setting the milk down on the old counter. You're very beautiful. Lots of guys must come into this store and tell you that every day. My boyfriend doesn't know anything about that, Lisa told the man, and offered him a light flirtatious smile. I'm considering calling off our relationship anyway. Oh. Lisa nodded her head. My uncle's wife, my Aunt Rachel, died two years ago. I was preparing to leave for college, but my uncle needed help running the grocery store. I didn't mind, although I'm really going nowhere with my life right now. Lisa looked around. Not many fish to pick from in this town, she continued. I don't think I've seen you around before. I'm with the circus, Clint told Lisa and flashed a charming smile. I guess you and I both are going nowhere fast for now. Lisa stared at him. The circus, she asked. You look more like a lawyer to me. Not me, Clint stated in a proud voice. I like to be free. The circus allows me all the freedom I need. Clint leaned against the counter. I attended law school a few years back. Horrible mistake. I learned a very hard lesson. A cruel lesson. What was that? Lisa dared to ask, ignoring the nagging feeling inside at the cool, calculating tone of his voice. Clint flashed another charming smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. Either work inside the system and bore yourself to death or become an outcast, he explained. I chose to become an outcast and use my talents to make people laugh. Lisa didn't know exactly how to decipher this man. All she did know for certain was that the guy was very charming, even if he was a drifter. She was bored and maybe she thought she could use the circus drifter to really make her boyfriend jealous. Nothing wrong with being that kind of outcast. Besides I like the circus, she said and tossed a cute smile at him. Say, I know this might seem a bit forward but would you like to have dinner with me at the diner tonight? Sure beats eating alone, Clint smiled, leaning in a little closer to gaze at her. What time? Six? Do I pick you up or meet you there? Clint asked. Meet me there, Lisa smiled and pushed the milk toward Clint. My name is Lisa, what's yours? Austin. Well, Austin, Lisa smiled and pushed the milk sitting on the counter toward Clint. The milk is on the house. My treat. And dinner will be on the house, my treat, Clint promised. He gave Lisa one of his best smiles and walked back outside into the snow. The clown only wears a mask to hide the monster, he grinned as he whispered to himself in the rushing wind. People love clowns. But when the clown takes off his mask, the nightmare begins. Clint walked to his motorcycle, climbed on and drove away into the snow. As he did, Manfred walked into Sarah's kitchen, wiping sleep out of his eyes. I guess I was more tired than I thought, Manfred yawned, still wearing his gray bathrobe. What's for lunch? Amanda rolled her eyes. Have some coffee first, huh, runt? Don't call me. Manfred yawned, a runt you dried up English muffin. Andrew looked at Sarah. Sarah shrugged her shoulders. More coffee, she asked Andrew. No thanks, Andrew told Sarah. He stood up and scooped the report. Sarah had printed for him up off the kitchen table. I need to get back to the station. Doc Downing promised to give me a full report after lunch. Andrew looked at Sarah. Are you sure you don't need to see the body, Sarah? You are the acting detective when Conrad is away. Sarah shook her head. I've seen enough of Clint Junerson's work, she told Andrew in a disgusted voice. She nodded at the chef's knife in the evidence bag. I have a feeling this time, he's playing a far more deadly game, though. I don't like the look on your face, Andrew said in a worried tone. He picked up the evidence bag and held it gingerly as he slipped on his gloves. Neither do I, 
Sarah acknowledged. Andrew, Junerson killed Brett Slopes as a message to me. I'm certain of that. However it all seems too simple. Sarah stood up. I'm only assuming Junerson might keep his act at the circus, but the more I think about it. Sarah looked down at the knife again. I don't know. Sarah, I need you to be on your game, Andrew pleaded. You're the detective, not me. I'm following your trail to catch this bear, not the other way around. Sarah rubbed her eyes. Junerson loves riddles, she told Andrew. All night long, I kept remembering some of the riddles he left attached to his victims. Each victim was killed in the same exact manner, Brett Slopes was no different. Sarah shook her head. There's too many questions running loose in my mind right now, Andrew. Junerson has the upper hand, and until he wants to play again, my hands are tied. Then we go back to the circus? Andrew said. He reached into the papers he was holding and pulled out a picture of a cruel looking man with long blonde hair wearing prison stripes. We have to catch this killer, Sarah. You go back to town, Andrew. Amanda, Manfred and I will take a drive out to the circus and look around. Now that it's daylight, well, the daylight helps. Sarah walked Andrew to the back door. The picture of Junerson you're holding, she warned, don't count on his appearance matching that photo. Andrew rubbed the back of his neck. Maybe I should plaster this photo all over town, order people to beware of strangers and to stay indoors. Sarah studied Andrew's worried face. She was tempted to agree with the man's statement, but held her tongue. The people of Snow Falls aren't cowards. They aren't stupid either. The people who live here understand what it means to survive, Andrew. We can't let a wild animal run them into a corner. That's exactly the type of situation that will only empower Junerson. Tell me about it, Andrew told Sarah in a frustrated voice. I'll call you with whatever updates Doc Downing gives me today. Who knows, maybe he'll find something helpful. In the meantime, get out to the circus and track down this killer. Sarah nodded her head, saw Andrew to his truck, and hurried back inside. Okay, guys, she said in a serious voice, I told Andrew that I believe Junerson will keep his act at the circus. I wasn't exactly being truthful. Oh no, Amanda moaned. Love, what shadows are you chasing in your mind now? Yeah. Spill the beans, Sarah, Manford begged. Sarah looked toward the kitchen window and studied the heavy falling snow. The clown is going to change his face, she whispered. That's the way of his riddles. Amanda looked at Manford. Manford shrugged his shoulders. I have no idea what she means, he said. Amanda walked her eyes back to Sarah. She knew what her best friend meant. Yeah, I guess I better check that ugly gun again, she said and prepared to walk into a dark nightmare. Sarah continued to stare at the snow. Okay clown, you have the upper hand, but I'm not going to be stupid this time I hope. Chapter 5 Lacey handed Sarah a brown paper cup full of fresh coffee. Tastes like dirt but it's all I've got she said in a rough but friendly voice. Manford, you get yourself on outside and go help Downey feed them elephants. I ain't paying you to stand around. But I'm on vacation, Manford told Lacey. Last night was our last show, remember? Besides, it's warm in here. Amanda glanced around the inside of Lacey's fifth-wheel RV. The interior was fancy and polished, sparkling clean. The design Lacey had chosen made Amanda feel as if she had walked back through time and entered an 18th century palace. Shiny mirrors and gold frames all around. Not what one would expect from a circus woman that was for certain. Oh, listen to your boss runt, she told Manford and happily took a sip of coffee from her own paper cup. Let us women folk talk. Stop calling me runt, you. Manford paused, shook his head and then simply looked up at Sarah. I'll be in the elephant tent if you need me. And don't expect overtime, Lacey told Manford and tipped Sarah and Amanda a quick wink. Good deeds pay for themselves. Manford shoved his hands into the pockets of his coat. Lacey, the way you pay me I'm better off living on good deeds. Don't you forget it either, Lacey laughed and lovingly sent Manford on his way. Now that it's just us ladies, let's chat. Lacey patted a fancy white and pink parlor couch. Sit down. 
Sarah remained by the door. I prefer to stand, she told Lacey in a polite voice. Amanda happily plopped down on the couch and found herself a warm spot. Lacey sat down next to Amanda, brushed at her long dress with a faded flower print, and then checked her gray hair. Last night was our last act, she pointed out. I'd really like to get my circus back on the road. I can't give a green light yet, Sarah apologized. Lacey, last night was very cold and dark. The killer has the upper ground on us and still does. Sarah took a sip of the coffee and winced. Wow, it does taste like dirt. Lacey nodded her head. This coffee was given to me in bulk by a man in Seattle who operates a charity for sick children. The coffee was donated to him by a man in Central America. Lacey folded her arms. He couldn't pay for the sick children to see the circus, wouldn't have charged him anyway, but he insisted I take the coffee as payment. I think the coffee tastes pretty good, Amanda told Lacey and took a sip. Yeah, real good. Sarah rolled her eyes. June bug, you would drink hot lava, she sighed and focused back on Lacey. Lacey, I'm sure the killer is traveling with your circus. All of my people gave statements to Chief Andrew, Lacey insisted. My people are clean, Sarah. I'm very particular. Do you know who is traveling with your people? Sarah gently interrupted Lacey. Lacey paused, taken aback. I don't poke my nose where it doesn't belong, if that's what you mean. Lacey drew in a deep breath. But, I have been wondering, there are a few single people working for me, Sarah. I ain't their mama, and I can't stop them from having traveling friends. My rule is that all outsiders stay in the living tents and RVs, away from the circus. I've never had a problem with any of my people breaking that rule. Lacey, I need to check each of them. I know, Lacey told Sarah. I figured that's why you came back. I watch too many murder mystery shows on television. I know the routine. Lacey looked at Sarah. My favorites are from the 50s and 60s. The modern stuff is trash. There's just no depth of character to the modern shows. Every person wears the same expression, talks the same way, acts the same way, and drama people can do without so much personal drama on those shows. Amanda grinned. She liked to hear Lacey fuss. Lacey reminded her of an old mother hen who liked to peck at stuff a little too hard sometimes. I don't like the modern shows either, she told Lacey and happily polished off her coffee. I like romantic comedies, personally. Oh, me too, Lacey beamed. My favorite is I Love Lucy. Lucy, Lacey chuckled. You're a girl after my own heart. Hey, ditto, Amanda laughed. She patted Lacey's hands. You need to come over for tea and muffins, love. Lacey looked up at Sarah. I would love to hang around, sweetie, but I do have a circus to manage. And with that, I think Sarah is anxious to start knocking on some doors. I'm afraid so, Sarah confirmed. Lacey, the killer will strike again. Maybe at the circus, maybe not. At this juncture, I can't really be certain. What I do know is if I don't start getting some footwork in, I'm going to cede the high ground to the killer. And who knows? Sarah carefully retrieved her gun, maybe I'll end up catching the killer this very day. Your eyes say no, Lacey told Sarah in a concerned voice. She stood up and fetched a warm brown coat, a thick knitted cap, and a pair of gloves. You need to knock on doors to let the killer know he's being hunted. Your intentions are to try and spook the killer into running, right? No, Lacey, Sarah replied in a careful voice, my intention is to capture a killer any which way I can. Sarah opened the door and stepped out into a heavy falling snow. Okay, let's start with everyone who is single, okay? I'll lead the way. Come on, sweeties. Lacey grabbed Amanda's hand and pulled her out into the snow. Oh, and I was so warm, Amanda whined. She quickly grabbed her coat closer to her, tucked her head down, and braved the cold and snow. Okay, which way? We'll start with a woman that I've been considering letting go, Lacey explained, fighting an icy gust of wind away by holding her arm up against her face. What is this woman's name? Sarah asked, and waited until the wind died down a little before continuing. Why do you want to let this woman go? 
Amy Holtzdale is the woman in question, Lacey explained. She lowered her arms and allowed her eyes to search across the snow-soaked main circus tent. Sure is pretty, she whispered, wishing her deceased husband were there to enjoy it with her. Lacey. Sarah asked. Lacey kept her eyes on the circus tent. My husband loved the snow, she told Sarah in a nostalgic voice. Once that crazy man even suggested we sell the circus and move right here to Alaska. I told him he needed to be put in a padded wagon and to forget such a silly notion. But as I stand here, all this snow, as cold as it is, I can now understand why my husband suggested such a thing. Lacey looked toward Sarah. I only keep the circus running because of my husband, you know? I have more than one person who would buy my circus for a pretty penny. But it ain't time to sell, never will be. I'll die with the circus the same way my husband did. Sarah saw a heavy sadness consume Lacey's eyes. The woman understood love and she understood sorrow. Lacey, if you tell me which RV belongs to Amy Holtzdale, I can. Better if I go with you, Sarah. Lacey motioned around toward the camp of snow-covered RVs. Not a single person is out and about, except for Downey and a couple of others who have to tend to the animals. My people are scared because word is that one of their own is the killer. Not a single one of them is willing to come out into this snow. Lacey shook her head at Sarah. I best go with you. Be easier that way. Lead the way, Sarah told Lacey in an understanding voice. Lacey nodded her head, took Amanda's hand and walked to Amy's run-down RV. Sarah followed behind, studying all the parked RVs while keeping her gun at the ready inside the right pocket of her coat. The sea of snow-covered RVs was a sight to see. The vehicles all seemed to hum with a strange and mysterious sound, like some kind of force field protecting the very essence of what a circus was. Inside each RV, even though each one appeared silent and empty, Circus people lived, those rejected by a decaying society, people that were lost yet who had found a shadow world that accepted anyone who decided to live under the big tent instead of under the roof of society. The same society that rejected the circus people came in droves to sit and watch in amazement people who they admired. People who could fly through the air, ride elephants, tame tigers, wear silly clown faces, juggle flaming torches and get shot out of cannons. Why? because for a couple of hours, these people became part of the circus as well. And that's what makes a circus special, Sarah whispered. Here we are, Lacey said, stopping in front of Amy's RV. I'll knock. Amanda moved back to Sarah and waited. Lacey is sure something, she grinned. Sarah nodded her head in agreement. Amy, this is Lacey, you in there? Lacey called out as she knocked on the RV door four times hard. Amy, you in there? Yeah, one second. Amy called out in a drowsy voice. She stumbled over to the front door, opened it, and peered down at Lacey. Yeah, Lacey, what can I do for you? She asked and slowly looked past Lacey and saw Sarah and Amanda. Who are your friends? Detective Sarah. Sarah Spencer, Sarah told Amy in a quick voice. This is my partner, Detective Hardcastle. Oh, here we go playing detective again, Amanda whispered under her breath. She drew in a cold breath of air and nodded her head. We need to ask you a few questions, she said, struggling to make her voice sound tough, even though she felt mighty silly. Sarah studied Amy's vacant glare. The poor woman was zonked out on pain pills. Yeah, well. Amy looked at Lacey. Look, Lacey, my money count has been right. I ain't been stealing from. Your money count was off $7 last night, Amy, Lacey corrected Amy. I saw you give two kids some free popcorn. And I'm okay with that. Lacey looked at Sarah with eyes that telegraphed, she's out of it. Amy, we're here because I need to know who you've been traveling with, okay honey? I know my policy is to never put my nose where it doesn't belong, but there has been a murder. Amy stared at Lacey with wobbly eyes. I don't know much about the guy, she told Lacey. His name is Austin. The icy winds didn't seem to bother Amy. The poor woman was so zonked out, she barely noticed that it was snowing. He went into town to get me some milk just now, okay? He's just some guy who keeps me company. 
it's not like we're getting married or anything. We haven't even kissed. Lacey had seen Clint only a few times, mostly from a distance. Okay, go back inside? Wait, Sarah told Amy. Lacey, I do need to ask this woman some questions. Go for it, honey. Lacey stepped outside. She's all yours. Miss Holtzdale, what does the man traveling with you look like? Sarah asked. Specifics, Amanda ordered Amy in a hard voice. Amy shrugged her sleepy shoulders. Blonde hair, handsome, doesn't say much. Sarah looked at Amanda. Could be, she said in an urgent voice. Miss Holtzdale, where did you meet the man you're traveling with? Why don't you ask Austin? Here he comes, Amy said and nodded her head past Sarah. Sarah spun around and saw a smiling face walking toward her carrying a gallon of nearly frozen milk. Sarah's first instinct was to yank her gun out but she quickly took control, stepped in front of Amanda and waited. Here's the milk, the man smiled. He lifted the milk up into the air. Cold ride but sure beautiful. Sarah stared into his face. She didn't see Clint Junerson anywhere. Instead she saw a charming, handsome man with a smile that could melt nearly any woman. But Sarah saw the man's eyes, yes, the man's eyes belonged to Clint Junerson, the vicious clown killer. Austin, she asked, pretending not to notice Clint's eyes. Austin McMill, Clint stated in a voice that showed no concern. Clint knew it was only a matter of time before Sarah began her questioning. Amy wasn't going to be immune. Besides, he wanted to see Sarah face to face. He hungered to see the face of the woman who had shoved a gun in his face and threatened to kill him. Revenge was going to be so sweet. My name is Detective Spencer, Sarah stated back, staring at Clint in his murderous eyes. Oh sure, Clint said in an easy voice. He brushed past Sarah and handed Amy the milk. This has to be about the murder that happened last night. Shame. Lacey looked at Clint with strange eyes. The man made her skin crawl. Clint glanced at Lacey and grinned at her. I didn't kill anyone, he said and smiled. I'm willing to answer any questions you have though. I mean, after all, I am just a traveling stranger. All eyes would fall on someone like me. Lacey took her eyes to Sarah. Sarah was staring at Clint in a way only a seasoned cop could. Where were you last night, she demanded. Why, watching the show, Clint told Lacey. Don't worry, I paid my fee. I even have a receipt to prove it. Clint smiled a creepy smile. After the show, I came right back to this RV and waited for Amy. I didn't even know about the murder until she told me. It's true, what Austin is saying is true, Amy said as she struggled to stay focused. Austin was waiting for me. Sarah knew she had no power to arrest Clint. Clint Junerson, the Clint Junerson she knew, was no more. A new, strange, and very deadly, Clint Junerson was standing before her wearing a new face and possibly even new fingerprints. Mr. McMill, I need your full name and social security number. I'm afraid I'm going to have to run a background check on you. Clint smiled, exposing perfectly white teeth. Hey, no problem. I'm all for helping the law, he told Sarah and pulled out a black wallet from his back pocket. Austin McMill is the name and making people smile is my game, he said, and looked deep into Sarah's eyes as if to say let the games begin. Sarah stood up from behind Conrad's desk and stretched her neck. He's cleaner than anyone I've ever seen, at least that's what his record shows, she said in an angry voice. We don't have a leg to stand on. Sarah focused on Andrew, who was standing next to the office window looking out at the front street. Clint Junerson has changed his face, masked his fingerprints, and managed to create an entirely new person, at least on paper. Andrew didn't know how to respond. So he asked the only question that came to mind, so what now, Sarah? Junerson is playing a game, Sarah told Andrew in a worried voice. I looked deep into his eyes, he knew I recognized him. He was waiting for me to show up. Sarah rubbed her nose. Junerson could have killed me at any moment, but he didn't, Andrew. He wants to make me suffer. That's his game. A game that isn't going to be restricted to the circus, right? Sarah stopped rubbing her nose. I lied to you, Andrew. I told you that I thought Junerson would stay at the circus, 
because I didn't want the town caught up in a panic. But the truth is, I doubt Junerson will keep his game small. But, I believe his game is designed to end at the circus. Sarah sat back down and picked up the phone on Conrad's desk. She called Pete. Pete, I located Junerson. Pete was sitting in a back booth at a seedy diner he loved to visit. A plate of eggs, hash browns and steak sat before him. Did you kill him? Pete asked in a quick hopeful voice. Kiddo, tell me you put that monster down. I wish I could, Sarah told Pete in a disappointed voice. Pete Junerson has changed his face. He has also managed to create a new identity, one with a clean paper trail. I'm talking about a legitimate birth certificate, social security number, banking account, driver's license, the works. Sarah snatched a piece of peppermint from a candy jar and dosed it into her mouth. Austin Heath McMill was raised in Sacramento, California. He attended the University of Utah. He served in the Navy for four years, as DD-214 is as legitimate as the rest of his junk. Pete thought about the lawyer Clint had teamed up with. Whoever the mysterious lawyer woman is, she must have some pretty skilled people at her fingertips. I can't arrest Junerson Pete. He knows that, Sarah said and struck the desk with her fist. Hey, you're sounding like my old partner again, Pete said in a proud voice. He forked a piece of steak doused with ketchup into his mouth and chewed. An old couple sitting at a separate booth were reading the day's paper and working on two bran muffins and a cup of coffee apiece. The old man was reading the front page and the old woman was reading the funnies. Pete wished he were as carefree as that pair of retirees. I feel like a cop again, Sarah confessed. Well, partner, since you feel like a cop again, you know by the tone of my voice that I have some bad news for you. Yeah, I guess that, Sarah told Pete and prepared for the worst. Hit me, Pete. Kelly Junerson is dead. Sarah closed her eyes. How? Accident. Hit by a sleepy trucker who drank too many of those stupid energy drinks, Pete explained. Witnesses said Kelly was sitting at a red light when the trucker plowed into her. She was pronounced dead a couple of hours later. I was hoping Kelly Junerson would be able to help us some more. Maybe she did, Pete said. He tossed some hash browns into his mouth and waved a coffee mug at a chubby waitress wiping down the front counter. More coffee, Rose? Yeah, yeah, always more coffee, Rose complained. Pete, how did Kelly Junerson help us? Sarah asked. I'm not sure yet, kiddo, Pete explained. I was able to have a look at her apartment, if that's what you want to call the garbage heap she was living in. I came up with nothing but overdue bills and a sea of empty liquor bottles. Rose walked a coffee pot to Pete's booth and filled his coffee mug. You're a doll. Just leave me a good tip, cheapskate, Rose fussed and walked away. Pete grinned. I'll leave you two pennies, you old fuss. Rose threw her hands at him. Anyway, kiddo, Pete continued, I came up empty. But? Sarah asked. My old friend Mitch managed to examine the clothes Kelly had been wearing. I found a piece of crumpled up paper with the letters A-L written on it. Nothing else. Pete swallowed a gulp of coffee. Too weak, Rose, he called out. Oh, plug it in your ear, Rose hollered back at Pete. A-L. Sarah asked. Could be initials. Could be the initials belonging to the lawyer who has a thing for killers, Pete agreed. Look, kiddo, I just got through examining Kelly Junerson's clothes about an hour ago. It's been a long night, and some good friends have been helping this retired cop break some rules. Pete took another sip of coffee. The department frowns on retired cops still being able to look at police stuff. Not in Snow Falls, Sarah informed Pete. She looked at Andrew. In Snow Falls, it's impossible for a cop to retire. I'm under the sun, and you're under the snow, kiddo. We're in two completely different worlds. Pete put some eggs into his mouth. Look, I'm going to go home and get some sleep after I eat. When my eyes are rested, I'm going to start trying to figure out who A.L. is. Sarah bit down on her lower lip. Pete, be careful, okay? You have a killer on your end, too. We're both in some serious hot water. Kiddo, I'm watching every shadow, Pete promised. 
I know I'm being watched. Whoever the second killer is, and I think it's the fancy lawyer Lady Kelly Junerson mentioned, she's not ready to stick her claws into me yet. Pete set his coffee down. Kiddo, I think Junerson and his deranged sidekick have no intention of killing us. What do you mean, Pete? Sarah asked. Revenge, Pete said in a simple voice, comes in many forms, kiddo. You know that. Sarah closed her eyes and saw the hideous snowman she had created, grinning at her. Going to prison, Sarah, gonna sit behind bars rotting while we kill the world, bye-bye to Conrad and Amanda and Manford and the baby. Sarah snapped her eyes open. Revenge, she whispered. Junerson plans to frame us for murder. That's my thinking, Pete rubbed his chin. If Junerson wanted us dead, we'd be dead by now, kiddo. The pies, the two murders, it was a message to show us just who is in charge. Pete put down his fork. Junerson and his sidekick prove they can kill and get away with it. That's step one, to smear it in our faces. Step two is to kill two more victims and connect their murders to us. And while we're rotting in prison, they're killing without a care in the world. Pete shook his head in disgust. To force your enemy to watch you kill innocent people while you're rotting behind bars, that's true revenge, kiddo. Pete lowered his eyes and studied his breakfast plate. I could be wrong about this, but my gut is telling me I swung the bat right over the plate. I don't think you're wrong, Pete. Sarah looked at Andrew. Andrew put the town on alert ASAP. The rules of the game have changed. Go. Hurry. Andrew rushed out of Conrad's office on scared legs, gathered up his men, and gave them orders to call the schools and all the businesses and have them close down. As Andrew did so, Sarah printed off a photo of the new Clint Junerson and ran it to the front room. Make copies and hand them out to everyone. Hurry, she ordered and ran back to the phone. Okay, Pete, I'm putting the town on alert and having my people hand out photos of Junerson, a.k.a. Austin McMill, to everyone. At least now I can make people aware. Earlier today, I didn't have a face and wasn't willing to allow an unseen monster to force the good people of this town back behind closed doors. Sarah rubbed her neck. Oh Pete, I don't know what I was really thinking last night or this morning. I keep seeing that awful snowman, keep seeing the people of Snowfalls huddled behind closed doors, keep seeing a shadowy monster lurking about turning me into a coward. You're all tangled up. Pete told Sarah in a calm, careful and caring voice. Maybe it's the hormones, kiddo, have you thought of that? Ever since you informed me, you and Conrad were going to start trying to have a little one, your mind has been in a different place. I'm not saying that's bad, because it isn't, kiddo. Pete gulped down some more coffee. You're thinking as a cop again, and that's what is important. I should have put the town on alert to begin with, it was stupid of me not to. But what did I have to work with? An unseen face? What was I supposed to do, let another killer terrorize my hometown? I hate backing down from bullies, Pete, but I can't risk the lives of innocent people. Sarah shook her head. Pete, in Los Angeles I was in charge of finding killers, not protecting an entire city. I've never been forced to make the kind of choices I'm being asked to make now. You're doing just fine, kiddo. One step at a time, one breath at a time. Sarah closed her eyes and saw Junerson's new face. How am I going to catch this guy, Pete? He has a new face, a new life. I can't touch him. I don't even have enough to bring him in for questioning. Amy Holtzdale vouched for him. The guy even has a receipt for his ticket to the circus show last night. He was probably watching me the entire time. Sarah felt anger inflame her cheeks. As it stands, anyone at the circus could have killed Brett Slopes, and anyone in Snow Falls for that matter. I mean an old enemy could have slipped into town and killed Brett Slopes, no riddle was left next to his body, very clever of Junerson. Pete watched the old man and old woman switch newspapers with one another and go back to reading. Kiddo, think smart and use your brain. You're not a stupid woman, do you hear me? he said in a tough voice. I didn't train a dummy or a weakling. Pete drained his coffee. Sarah, you were and still are one of the best homicide detectives I've ever trained and worked with, do you hear me? You caught the back alley killer. With your help. But you were the one, Sarah. 
It was your brain that caught that sewer rat not mine, Pete told Sarah in a firm voice. You and I have tangled with some difficult cases, and Junerson's case wasn't a walk in the park. Kelly Junerson's anonymous tip was what truly saved our butts, Pete. And that's the way of it, kiddo, Pete reminded her. Sometimes a cop just catches a break and we caught a break. That doesn't mean we're bad cops or that we weren't doing our jobs. Sarah, you know as well as I do that each cop faces a world of unknown variables each day. Each day we face a world full of monsters who are all different. We're not superheroes, kiddo. We're just flesh and blood people, cops, trying to make life a little safer one day at a time. Pete? Hush and listen to me, Pete snapped but gently. Junerson is in your neck of the woods, Detective Garland. You better get off your butt and catch this guy, do you hear me? You better do your job, Detective, because I'm going to be doing mine. Sarah closed her eyes. As she did, a tear slipped out and rolled down her cheek. She was so tired of the killers and the murders and the monsters and the snowman. All she wanted was to have a baby and become a mother. But Sarah knew deep down in her heart that unless she captured Junerson, her dreams of becoming a mother would never come true. And even worse, if she failed to capture Junerson, the monster might go after everyone she cared about and loved. As a matter of fact, Sarah knew Junerson would kill everyone she loved in order to worsen her punishment while she rotted behind prison bars. I have to knock this monster off his high horse, Pete. Then do it, Pete told Sarah. Do whatever you have to do to catch this killer detective. In the meantime, I'm going to get some sleep and start trying to find out who this AL person is. Pete saw Sarah's beautiful face appear in his mind. He sure loved his sweet Sarah as the daughter he never had. Keep your gun at the ready and strike without hesitation if needed. Pete, if I capture Junerson, he'll escape from prison again. Killing him may be my only choice. Then make sure you don't miss your shot, Detective Garland, Pete said and ended the call. Sarah put down the phone, wiped her tear away and walked back out into the front office area. Andrew, she said in a tough voice, I want the plows to stop running. I want every business closed down and people sent home. I want the schools closed and every cop we have out on patrol. We're working on it, Sarah, Andrew promised. What are you thinking about the plows? If our killer is going to strike again, at least outside of the circus, he's going to have to do so on foot. I'm not going to make it easy for him, Sarah explained. She looked at the cops in the room, faces of men she knew and trusted. Let's make sure the schools are safely closed and the children get home safely, guys. We're going to have to shut down and lock this town up tight. In the meantime, I have to call Lacey. What about Amanda and Manford? Andrew asked. They'll leave the diner as soon as it closes and come rushing our way, Sarah promised. She walked back to Conrad's office and called Lacey. Lacey, lock down your circus. No one leaves, is that clear? I'm stopping the plows from running. Pass the word. You think that creepy Austin McMill is the killer, don't you? Lacey asked, holding a gun in her right hand. Stay away from him, Lacey. He's my problem. Just pass the word that the plows are stopping and that no one is to leave the fairgrounds. In the meantime, keep an eye on Amy Holtzdale's RV and tell me if you see our suspect leave. And if anyone asks what is going on, tell them there's been a bad accident and that the plows are needed elsewhere. Will do. Sarah hung up the phone and closed her eyes. You're on my turf now, she whispered in a determined voice, even though deep inside she was very scared. Clint Junerson was a killer, and if he was backed into a hard corner, he wouldn't hesitate to change his plan and simply kill his opponent. She prayed it didn't come to that. Chapter 6 Lisa Mills stepped into Conrad's office wearing a frantic expression. She spotted Sarah standing at the office window, peeking out into the snow. Detective Garland, she asked. Detective Spencer, Sarah corrected Lisa. She turned and saw a lovely young woman wearing a snow-dusted blue coat and a white winter hat. You're Lisa Mills, aren't you? You've come through my line at the grocery store a few times. I wasn't really very talkative. Sorry. Lisa raised a nervous hand and brushed snow off her coat. 
Detective I, you see, she said in a shaky voice, this man, Austin, came into the grocery store earlier. Sarah folded her arms. Yes, she asked. Lisa struggled to steady her nerves. He's the same man that is on the photo the cops are circulating around town. This man, I agreed to have dinner with him tonight. Lisa bowed her head in shame. He was charming and handsome, oh, I was so stupid. Sarah stared at Lisa. As she did, her mind saw Lisa transform into a dangerous queen poised on a very complicated chessboard. Before she could say anything though, Manfred entered the office. Oh sorry, he said, spotting Lisa. I thought you were alone. What is it, Manford? Sarah inquired. Andrew asked me to tell you that the school is closed and all the kitties are home safe. Good, Sarah told Manford in a relieved voice. I want a double shift at the hospital. Yep, Andrew has already called in a few reserves and sent some guys over to the hospital armed with rifles. Sarah nodded her head. Good, she said. The entire town is closing down. The only ones being kept in the dark are the circus employees. But, Sarah bit down on her lip. She stared at Lisa with curious eyes. Manford, please go tell Andrew I need to speak with him. Got it. Manford smiled at Lisa and hurried away. Lisa, honey, sit down. Lisa nervously sat in a chair. I hope I'm not in any trouble. I didn't know who this jerk was, honestly. I only agreed to have dinner with him in order to make my boyfriend jealous. You're not in any trouble, Sarah assured Lisa. She walked behind Conrad's desk, sat down, and picked up a pen and pad of paper and stared at it as her troubled mind began to form a very risky, uncertain plan. What time were you supposed to have dinner with this man? she asked. Six. Sarah checked the wall clock. Lisa, the man you were scheduled to have dinner with tonight is a deadly killer. Chances are he was planning to kill you. You were going to become his first official victim in a very sick and twisted game. Oh my goodness, Lisa gasped. Detective Y, she begged. I didn't do anything to that awful man. Because a killer is a soulless black widow spider, Lisa, Sarah explained. She slowly began to draw a chessboard on the pad of paper. At this juncture, Lisa, I'm not entirely certain how I'm supposed to catch this Black Widow spider. He's very clever and extremely dangerous, poisonous too. Sarah began to doodle a queen chess piece. I've been standing at that window for the last hour racking my brain. Can't you just arrest him for crying out loud? Lisa begged. I'm afraid not, Sarah explained. Lisa, the man you were going to have dinner with tonight has changed his legal status completely, name, social security number, birth certificate, even his physical facial features. I don't understand. Lisa, when I lived in Los Angeles, my old partner and I caught the clown killer. The clown killer was a man by the name of Clint Junerson. Clint Junerson is actually the man you met, who introduced himself as Austin. Clint Junerson, at least in the system, isn't the man who is in town. Austin McMill is in town and he has a spotless record. If I arrested him, a lawyer would have him out and walking in no time. Lisa could barely believe what Sarah was telling her. Is this for real? She asked in a confused voice. Are you trying to tell me you know who the killer is, but you can't arrest him? I can't touch Austin McMill even though he's really Clint Junerson, Sarah told Lisa. She finished drawing the queen and turned the pad of paper toward Lisa. As long as Austin McMill isn't breaking the law, I can't touch him. But believe me, Lisa, underneath that handsome face, Clint Junerson, the real monster, is planning to strike, and soon. Lisa stared at the hand drawn chessboard and then focused on the queen, puzzled. The little figure had smooth, shoulder length hair, just like Lisa. What will we do? We can't just sit around like dummies, she insisted. No, Lisa, we can't. Sarah tossed down the pad of paper. I've been searching my mind for a way to capture Clint Junerson, and so far I have come up empty-handed. I have the town on lockdown, but so what? The black widow I need to crush will just throw its deadly web over the town. Sarah stood up and walked back to the window. Lisa, Clint Junerson isn't stupid. He's a very clever man who possesses a high intelligence. 
He's not going to walk into a trap. Once he finds out that his photo has been circulating in town and that people are aware of him, he'll simply change course. Why? Because he wants me to suffer. I'm his target and Snow Falls is his playground. Then leave town, Lisa begged. Detective, no offense but people know you've brought trouble to Snow Falls before. I mean, if you leave town, this creep will follow you, right? No, Sarah told Lisa in a regretful voice. Lisa, if I thought for a moment that Junerson would chase after me, I would leave Snow Falls in a split second. Junerson will simply kill someone here, in order to punish me. Eventually he would track me down again, and the game would start all over again. The spider must be killed in the snow. Well, what are you going to do? Lisa insisted in a panicked voice. I agreed to have dinner with a killer. This guy knows where I work, knows my name, knows what I look like, detective. My life is in danger. Of course Lisa's life was in danger. Clint Junerson was going to make her his first official victim, the shot that would begin the race. Sarah knew this. She knew Clint Junerson was going to kill Lisa, as sure as the poor girl was sitting before her. What could she do? Send Lisa away with a pat on the back and a weak promise that she would be okay? Junerson wants revenge, Lisa. He's after me, and his partner is after my old friend who lives in Los Angeles. Sarah walked back to Conrad's desk, picked up the pad of paper, and showed Lisa the queen again. The only way to catch a killer is to outsmart a killer. I don't understand. Andrew knocked on the office door and walked into the office. Yes, yeah, Sarah, he asked. Manford said you wanted a word. Close the door. Andrew closed the office door and looked at Lisa. Did you tell Sarah? I did, Lisa promised. She pointed at the notepad with a scared finger. All she keeps doing is showing me this drawing. Andrew looked at the pad of paper Sarah was holding. Sarah? What's this about? Sarah slowly lowered the pad of paper. Andrew, I've been standing in this office struggling to unlock a door that would lead into a room full of answers. I can't locate the door I need. Sarah tossed the pad of paper down and rubbed her eyes. I can't touch Junerson, Andrew. Junerson is hiding behind a fake profile that is clean. Even if he kills, if I don't catch him. Sarah stopped rubbing her eyes and looked up at Andrew. I need a hidden queen. A hidden queen? Andrew asked. Yes. Sarah picked up a brown coffee mug and took a sip of warm coffee. Lisa was scheduled to have dinner with Junerson tonight at 6 o'clock. I think that may be the doorway I'm searching for. What? Lisa gasped. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? Lisa stood up and looked at Andrew. This woman is insane. I don't think so, Andrew told Lisa as he stared into Sarah's eyes. Okay, Detective Spencer, what's on your mind? We have the town on lockdown, Sarah said, ignoring Lisa's insult. But if we keep a skeleton crew running in order to make the town look normal and use Lisa as bait, we may be able to stomp on our spider. What? Lisa gasped again. You're insane. I came here to confess a horrible truth to you and seek safety and you, you want to put my life in even more danger. Lisa stormed over to the office door. Lady, some people in this town like you, I'm not one of them, she snapped. Andrew leaned back against the office door before Lisa could open it. Now you just stop right there, Lisa, he ordered in a stern voice. I've known your uncle a good many years. He's a good man, one of the best I've ever had the honor of meeting. And I know he raised you up right. Do you really think the Snow Falls Police Department would put you in mortal danger? Lisa's fire and indignation deflated a little. That's what I thought. You hush that mouth and show the law some respect. That woman? Her name is Detective Spencer, Andrew told Lisa. Lisa turned and stared at Sarah. You want to put my life in danger, she said in a desperate voice. I couldn't care less what your name is or who you are, do you hear me? Sarah had a thick skin, having thick skin was part of a cop's arsenal. She could take verbal abuse and shake it loose. Lisa, Junerson has marked you. If you leave this office he'll track you down, she warned. 
Your only choice is to do exactly as I say. What? Lisa asked and threw her trembling eyes at Andrew. She can't be serious. I'm afraid Detective Spencer is very serious, Andrew told Lisa. Sarah drew in a regretful breath. It was time to manipulate a scared heart, but what choice did she have? She needed a hidden queen. Lisa, Clint Junerson, the man who is walking around pretending to be Austin McMill, has marked you. When a killer marks a victim, that's it. The victim has very little chance of escape. I've seen it happen time and time again while I worked homicide in Los Angeles. What are you saying? Lisa begged. I'm dead. Why don't you just lock me up in a jail cell? He can't get me there. I'm saying that if you want to live, do exactly as I ask, Sarah told Lisa in a stern cop's voice. Lisa, I have to catch this killer. Do you think a locked jail would stop him? He's already killed one innocent man to catch my attention, and he's not going to stop until he's quenched his thirst for revenge. I. Lisa spun around and locked her eyes on Andrew. You can't keep me safe. This is a nightmare. Get out of my way, I'm leaving town, she demanded. Junerson will track you down, Lisa, Sarah warned, hating herself every step of the way. The very thought of what Junerson would do to Lisa made her a little sick to her stomach. She began to speak again, but stopped when the image of her ex-husband floated into her troubled mind. She saw a man she had once loved and desired to spend the rest of her life with a man who had betrayed her and brought the back-alley killer to Snow Falls. Without notice, Sarah felt her heart break and tears begin to form. She quickly turned away from Lisa and walked to the office window. You can run, Lisa, but you'll never stop running, ever. I should know, I've never stopped running inside of my heart. Andrew saw Sarah wipe away a tear. Sarah, what do you want me to do? He asked in a caring voice. Put Lisa in a holding cell if she truly thinks that will keep her safe, Sarah told Andrew. Or, if she chooses, she can remain in this office and agree to help me capture a killer. Andrew focused on Lisa. What will it be, he asked. Lisa saw Sarah wipe away a second tear. The woman was very upset, and the woman she began to understand was human. Detective Spencer, I'm terrified. I don't want to die. Please understand that. I understand that you're scared. Sarah slowly turned and faced Lisa. I wouldn't dare let Junerson kill you, Lisa. I know you don't trust my words, but right now my words are all I have to offer you. Sarah walked back to the desk, picked up a brown file and pulled out a set of photos. These are the people Junerson killed in the past, Lisa. I would have never captured him if it hadn't been for his sister, my hidden queen. I need another hidden queen. Lisa hesitantly took the photos from Sarah and with tortured eyes began looking into the faces of the normal innocent people who had once lived ordinary lives. People who woke up grumpy, drank coffee, fought traffic, fussed until lunchtime, and skipped home on happy feet when the workday came to an end. She looked into the faces of people who had had families, homes and lives, people who had once smiled and laughed and loved. Only now the people she was looking at were dead, buried and forgotten by a busy world. Across the top of each photo a red stamp of blurring ink blared the word victim. Austin McMill will kill more people unless we stop him, won't he? Lisa asked in a low whisper. She raised her scared eyes and looked into Sarah's concerned face. This set of photos will grow thicker, won't it? Sarah nodded her head. Lisa, Unless we stop Clint Junerson, a.k.a. Austin McMill, yes, more people will die, not just in Snow Falls but in Los Angeles and who knows where else. Sarah took the photos back from Lisa, placed them back into the file, and focused on Andrew. I need to call Lacey, Andrew. While I do, I need you to create a realistic skeleton crew that will help me fool Junerson into believing everything is copacetic in town. I'll do my best. Andrew promised and stormed out of the office on urgent legs. Okay, Lisa, you and I need to talk, Sarah said. Close the door and get comfortable. Lisa felt terrified, but what could she do? If she ran, Junerson would find her. Now I understand why you can't run, she told Sarah, close the office door and prepared to enter a nightmare. He's on the move, Lacey told Sarah in an urgent voice. 
I saw him sneak into the main circus tent. Lacey kept her station at the window in her fifth wheel. It'll be dark soon. Did you pass the word around? Sarah asked as she checked her gun and then tossed a quick eye at Amanda. Junerson is on the move, Junebug. Go tell Andrew. Oh, this is going to be one of those nights, Amanda whimpered. Love, can I just stay indoors with a nice hot cup of tea? You're my partner, Junebug. I need you. Amanda looked into Sarah's troubled face. Her heart broke. How could she say no to such a sad woman? Love, I'll always stand by you, she promised, checked her own gun and hurried out of the office. Sarah eased back in Conrad's desk chair. Lacey, did you pass the word? Sure I did, Lacey promised. I told all of my workers that the circus was on lockdown, just like you told me. I even changed the story around, after you called me about an hour ago. You told everyone the circus was on lockdown because the man who killed Brett Slopes was being chased down in town, right? You bet I did. I changed your accident story into the killer story. Lacey kept her eyes peeled on the main circus tent. I wonder what that no-good dog is up to. Stay away from Clint Junerson, Sarah warned Lacey in a stern tone. That monster is a killer and will not hesitate to strike at anyone who comes across his path. You're not telling this old gal something she doesn't know, Sarah. I looked into that creature's dark eyes. I know. Still, Lacey thought, she had to know what Clint was doing in the main tent. So she quickly pulled away from the window, eased open the door to the fifth wheel and stepped outside into a heavy falling snow without a coat. I'll call you back in a second, she told Sarah and ended the call. Now let's see what you're doing. Lacey sneaked up to the back entrance of the tent and peeked inside. Clint was pulling his motorcycle out from behind a set of wooden bleachers. Oh, Lacey whispered and hurried behind another set of bleachers. Clint didn't notice Lacey. His mind was on the weather. He had to make it into town before the roads became impassable. He pushed the motorcycle out into the snow, studied the darkness that was falling all around the silent circus, and then began the chore of forcing his bike toward the front street. Lacey watched his every step. She waited until Clint was able to reach the front street and ride away before calling Sarah back. He's on his way toward town. I just saw him ride off on a motorcycle. I told you to stay away, Sarah fussed. But thanks. Thank me later, Lacey told Sarah as her teeth began to chatter. I need to go to Frost. Call me when the main event is over. I will, Sarah promised. Lacey nodded her head and hurried back to her fifth wheel. Main event coming up, Sarah whispered, walked over to the office window and studied the heavy falling snow. Okay, Lisa, let's hope Clint falls for the bait. Andrew walked into Conrad's office with Amanda right behind him. Okay, I have Lisa at the diner, he explained. Two of our guys are undercover at the diner. I have Andy perched on a rooftop with a rifle. Andy has assured me he has a clear shot into the diner. Is Matt in the diner kitchen? Sarah asked. Andrew nodded his head. Matt is in position. John, Brent and Tim are out on foot patrol, pretending to be salting down the front sidewalks. Amanda was impressed. For a small town, we're sure on top of things, she told Sarah. You guys have people everywhere. There's no way that rotten killer is going to escape. Sarah slowly turned away from the window. Junebug, Junerson will spot every cop we have on duty. He knows I'm setting a trap for him. But we have Lisa. Amanda insisted. We have Lisa, yes, Sarah nodded her head, but Lisa isn't my hidden queen. Andrew looked at Amanda with confused eyes. Amanda shrugged her shoulders. What do you mean, love? she asked. You'll see, Sarah promised. I can't explain the riddle right now, Junebug. All I can do is take one letter in the riddle at a time and try to make it work out in my favor. Sarah locked her eyes on Andrew. Her entire future was riding on one single night. If Junerson won, she would never have a baby, she would lose her husband, her best friend, and the town she had grown to love. Sarah knew she had to play smart. Andrew, I want you, Mitch and Howard armed and on normal foot patrol in uniform. 
Mitch and Howard are out front, Andrew assured Sarah, trusting in the woman's experience. He respected Sarah and respected her smarts. Sarah nodded her head. Lacey said she saw Junerson leave the circus on a motorcycle. He's coming our way. The street leading to the circus hasn't been plowed in a while, so he won't be making tracks very fast. We have about half an hour at the most. Sarah walked to the desk, snatched up a mug, drained the coffee, and looked at Amanda. Okay, Junebug, it's time for you and me to go for a walk. A walk in this snow? Amanda asked and then simply bowed her head. Yes, we'll go for a lovely walk in the snow and freeze our noses to the bone. When spring arrives, our brave town will find our frozen bodies clinging to the front door of our coffee shop, one step away from being saved, one step away from a warm muffin, one step away from claiming sanity. Amanda raised her head with a dazed smile. Deadly virus hot springs, killers, mafia, crooked FBI agents, insane kid in Oregon? Alaska is supposed to be a nice place to live, a place to get away from the real crazies. But do they leave us alone? No. And who gets stuck playing the hero? Little Miss English Muffin from London. Amanda threw her hands up into the air and walked out of the office fussing to herself. She'll be okay, Sarah promised Andrew and quickly checked her coat. Is Manford in place? Manford is hidden inside your coffee shop, Andrew promised Sarah. He looked into her weary eyes. Are you sure about this, Sarah? I mean, you can tell me what you're thinking. I'll sure be more than happy to listen. I'm not so sure what I'm thinking myself, Sarah explained. If I'm wrong, at least I'll have you guys to fall back on. If I'm right, then I'll catch Junerson on my own. Andrew rubbed his chin. I have no other choice but to trust you, Sarah. And I do trust you. I trust your experience. But let me tell you, I wish you'd tell me what's going on in that mind of yours. Sarah stared at the office door. Andrew, Junerson is a clever killer. He liked riddles and he knows how to hide behind masks. Sarah slowly folded her arms. I'm not sure why Junerson chose to become a clown, I'm sure I'll never know for that matter. What I do know is that he's a killer, a deadly killer, Andrew, that has already killed one man and has intentions to kill again, again, and again. If I mess up. Sarah looked down at her hands. Andrew, I want to become a mother. I want to buy diaper cream and know what it feels like to wake up at two in the morning to the sound of a hungry cry. Becoming a mother is all I've been able to think about. In my heart, it's a deep, burning fire. But right now I have to be a cop, think as a cop, and act as a cop. Sarah checked her gun again. If I mess up, I'll never be a mother. I can't drop the ball. Sarah, you've never dropped the ball. Yes I did, Andrew, Sarah objected. She shoved her gun into the right pocket of her coat. I should have put this town on alert immediately after Brett Slopes's murder. I didn't want to give Junerson that satisfaction, but deep down, I knew that if I put the town on alert, on lockdown, I would be placing myself on lockdown as well. I didn't want to be scared. Truth is, I'm terrified. Sarah looked into Andrew's eyes. I'm terrified that Junerson will harm my baby before it's even born. I feel like I'm now fighting for two lives instead of one, I feel. What? Andrew asked. Sarah fought back a tear. I feel my baby, Andrew, she whispered in a strange voice. I know that someday I'm going to have my baby, a little boy. I can feel him, Andrew. Conrad can feel him. Sarah raised her head. I can't risk losing Conrad. He'll run home and try to fight Junerson, Andrew. I believe I know Junerson's game, but I can't be certain. I have to handle this case my way, for the sake of my son and my husband, for Amanda, you and this town, for everyone I've come to love and call my family. Andrew walked over to Sarah and patted her shoulder. Okay, Detective Spencer, you're in charge. We'll do things your way. But just remember, someday when your son is born, I want him named after me. How about Conrad Andrew Spencer? Sarah promised Andrew and forced a weak smile to her face. Let's get to work, Chief. You bet. Sarah followed Andrew out of Conrad's office. She found Amanda standing at the front door putting her gloves on. 
Okay, Junebug, let's go for that walk. If I didn't love you. Amanda promised Sarah and then simply sighed. I expect a grand shopping trip out of this Los Angeles. I mean I want all the trimmings added too, steak dinner, donuts, fancy hotels, the works. How about a day at O'Malley's and all the kosher chili dogs you can eat? Sarah asked. Amanda placed her hands onto her hips and considered Sarah's offer. Andrew grinned. He knew the answer. All the kosher chili dogs that I can eat? She asked in a curious voice. All the kosher chili dogs that you can eat, Sarah promised. Well, old man O'Malley did order that new line of vintage sweaters, Amanda said in a thoughtful voice. She lifted her hand and rubbed her chin. Well, I do love O'Malley's, and I really don't want to leave Snow Falls until my hubby gets home. Amanda looked at Sarah. Okay, a full day at O'Malley's with all the kosher chili dogs that I can eat. Deal, Sarah promised. She grabbed Amanda's hand and turned to face Andrew. I'll be in touch if I strike gold. If I end up kicking at dirt, I'll come back to town and meet up with Manford at the coffee shop. Okay, boss, Andrew told Sarah and lifted a worried thumbs up into the air. Let's get to work. Sarah nodded her head, walked Amanda out into the snow and looked around. It'll be dark before we arrive. Arrive? Amanda asked, as the icy winds began biting into her lovely face. I thought we were going for a walk. We are, Sarah promised. But first we have to go for a drive. Let's go. Amanda sighed. Walk, drive, crawling through an oversized sewer in order to reach some old lady's house, what haven't we done? Sarah pulled Amanda over to her jeep. You drive. Sure love, let the little Brit drive. Amanda crawled into the driver's seat, slapped snow off her coat and buckled up. Where to? Sarah buckled her seatbelt and popped on the heat. Gingerbread House Lane. Amanda made a funny face. Love, that's where Tracy Farnsworth lives. I know. Tracy Farnsworth came in second at the Miss Alaska pageant, Amanda pointed out. And if my memory is correct, that snotty brat only bought a cabin this far out in order to sulk. Not a single person in town has said one nice thing about her, including me. When I bumped into that brat at the grocery store, she gave me a look colder than an iceberg. I know. I ran into her at the diner. Then why pray tell are we going to visit a snotty brat love? Because if I'm right, Junerson is going to be paying Tracy Farnsworth a visit too. Sarah began to warm her gloves over the front vents. Junebug, she said in a careful voice, I couldn't tell Andrew what my mind has been chewing on. You wouldn't even tell me, love. Not in the company of listening ears, Sarah explained. Now that we're alone, I can tell you exactly what I believe Junerson is going to do and who his next victim is going to be. Amanda looked at Sarah, read her friend's eyes, and then simply turned on the windshield wipers and backed away from the police station. Okay, love, spill the beans. A twin, Sarah confessed as the inside of the jeep slowly began to warm up. A twin? Amanda asked as she eased the jeep out of town with extreme caution. The roads were icy, and darkness was falling over the town like a stealthy hardened blanket. A twin? Sarah nodded her head. She leaned back in her seat and pulled a pad of paper from her coat pocket. Junerson wanted me to know who he was, she explained opened the pad of paper and stared at a few scribbled ideas she had written down. Junerson wants me to think I know who he is, but the man who is going to have dinner with Lisa tonight isn't the real monster. The real monster, June Bug, will be slithering around in the darkness seeking a real victim. The date with Lisa is a decoy. Amanda glanced at Sarah with worried eyes. Love, are you certain of this? If Pete's theory is right, Sarah replied, then Junerson will go after someone who will bring a lot of unwanted attention. Sarah raised her eyes and studied the heavy falling snow as Amanda drove out of town. One lonely snowflake after another struck the windshield like a cold fist that would not allow room for error. Junerson is after me, Junebug, and he's going to make sure he keeps my mind trapped inside a box that he has created. That was my mistake the first time. I won't allow myself to make the same mistake twice. My baby, my son depends on his mama being right. 
As Amanda drove out of town, Clint Junerson aimed his motorcycle toward a rental cabin. Inside, his twin was waiting. Time to play, my friend, Clint laughed into the snow. Time for the riddle to begin. Chapter 7 Pete had no idea if the beautiful woman he was watching get into a fancy BMW was the right AL or not. He puffed on his cigar and waited. If you're my girl, he warned, you're going down. Amelia Lopez, unaware that Pete was watching her, settled into the front seat of her BMW and then made a quick call. Status? she demanded in an icy voice. Cop is still absent, a man's voice replied. He came back to his office about an hour ago, stayed a few minutes and then left again. I followed him, but lost his scent when he mingled in with all the work traffic. Idiot, Amelia hissed. I pay you good money to follow him. Amelia gritted her teeth. Stay at your location. I'm on my way. Hey, listen, the man complained. I've been thinking and I've decided to back out of the deal, okay? I mean, sure, the money is good, but lady, you're crazy. The man stepped away from the edge of a damp industrial roof that faced Pete's office building and glanced around. I don't know why you have it in for this cop, lady, but murder wasn't part of the package. Who said anything about murder? Amelia hissed. The last thing in the world she needed was for a hired moron to become a loose string. The cop is part of a case I'm working on. Look, maybe you're telling the truth and maybe you're lying. All I know is that word is floating around the street that the homeless woman that was found dead had dealings with you. Who said? Amelia demanded. If you keep your ears to the ground, you hear things, the man told Amelia. I may be a man in need of money, and you may be a woman in need of a former army ranger as a hired gun, but I'm not stupid, lady. I'm just a veteran wasting away, invisible. And that's why I'm going to vanish from your eyesight. I'll track you down and kill you unless... You can't track me down, lady, the man laughed and tossed the cell phone Amelia had given him off the roof and walked away into a miserable life. Amelia threw the cell phone she was holding down into the passenger seat and grabbed the steering wheel. Her lovely cheeks turned red. You're dead, Pete, she warned as her dark brown eyes began to glow with rage. No prison is dark enough for you now. I'll simply kill you. Clint Junerson will just have to accept the sudden change in plans. I cannot risk leaving you alive any longer. The man I hired to follow you may turn and speak with you. Or worse, the cops. Emilia forced the BMW to life and sped out of a sub-level parking garage tucked under the law firm she worked for. Pete puffed on his cigar, waited a couple of minutes, and then exited the parking garage, placed his car into heavy downtown traffic and waited. It wouldn't be hard to pick out Amelia's flashy BMW once the traffic thinned out. You just might be my girl, Pete said, puffing on his cigar, sitting beside a city bus. Minutes later, the traffic began to inch forward under a green light. Pete eased his car under the light and forced a snotty teenager to let him merge into the right lane. The teenager gave Pete a few rude words but stopped talking when Pete flashed his badge at him. Punk, Pete mumbled and focused back on Amelia's BMW. The BMW was three cars ahead of him. Easy as pie. Pete leaned back and worked on his cigar as he followed Amelia out of the downtown area. Amelia gritted her teeth. She assumed Pete was either at his old police station or at home, so she made a beeline toward the office building Pete now called his second home. When Pete's car didn't come into view, she quickly drove one block over, parked beside a green moving van and walked back to Pete's building. I'll have to wait, she hissed. Pete watched Amelia reach his building, a vicious, ugly killer wearing the mask of a pretty woman dressed in a stylish black leather jacket that matched her hair. Hello, Amelia, he whispered, spit out his cigar, and crawled out from under a parked SUV. Looks like old Pete still has some brains, doesn't it? Pete hurried behind his building, fished out a set of keys, unlocked a back door, and sneaked inside just as Amelia reached his office door. Amelia studied the empty hallway, examined each closed door, inhaled the smell of stale carpet, and focused back on the office door. At first it seemed as if she were going to walk away from the door, but then she drew out a lock-picking device from her jacket pocket, 
inserted the device into the lock on the door, and went to work. A few seconds later, the lock on the door made a metallic click. Amelia shoved the lockpicking device back into her jacket pocket and sneaked into Pete's office on silent legs. Tonight you die, she promised as her eyes scanned Pete's office. The lights were off. Dusty shadows roamed all over the room. The smell of cigar smoke and Chinese food cluttered the air. Amelia wiped at her nose and carefully began examining the contents in Pete's desk. Pete, being clever, had left a fake case file for Amelia to find. The file was on a woman named Allie Loberson, a fake woman Pete had made up. Amelia studied the file and then read a note Pete had attached to the file with a paperclip. Mail this file to Sarah Garland. Found ALAL is connected to Junerson. Amelia tossed down the note and studied the picture of a lovely model that Pete had randomly chosen off the internet. So you think this is me? Amelia whispered, wondering how Pete had even come up with the initials AL to begin with. Yes, now you must die for certain. Outside in the hallway, Pete eased up to his office door and stuck his ear to the wood. He heard movement inside, and then he heard Amelia promise to kill him. Perfect, he whispered, simply pulled out his gun and like a cop in some old black and white movie, kicked the office door open. Amelia spun away from Pete's desk and went for her gun. Not a move, sister. Pete yelled and fired a warning shot at the floor. Amelia froze. Never in her life had she ever been faced with a chance of dying. Now the man she was tracking down to kill had the upper hand on her, and might even kill her. Death was no fun when you were on the receiving end. Suddenly Amelia felt very stupid. Please don't kill me, she begged, threw her hands into the air and looked at Pete with terrified eyes. Please don't kill me. Pete stepped into his office, tossed on the lights, kicked the office door shut, and studied Amelia. You killed the homeless woman, didn't you, Ms. Lopez? He asked in a tough voice. And you came here to kill me. Why? Because I gave your boy the slip. I don't know what you're talking about, Amelia lied. I, I work for a law firm. I came here to speak with you about a case. My boss needs someone to, too. Amelia struggled to think. Staring at the barrel of Pete's gun was hurting her ability to think clearly. Clint, she admitted to herself bitterly, had always been the brains. She had fooled herself into thinking she was his equal. Yet she showed herself to be an intelligent woman, a woman who could become Clint's partner, someone who would help him spread terror and fear across the landscape of California. We need someone to track down a client for us. Pete narrowed his eyes. Like Clint Junerson, he asked. Amelia felt cold sweat begin to pour down her face. She no longer felt beautiful or daring. Instead, she felt foolish and very ugly, like a wart attached to a frog. I. Save it for death row, Pete warned Amelia, because that's exactly where you're going. Pete fished a pair of handcuffs out of the pocket of his overcoat and tossed them at Amelia. Put those on. Amelia watched the handcuffs strike the floor with panicked eyes. No. I. Now. Pete warned. Okay, okay. Amelia bent down, picked up the handcuffs, and hesitantly put them onto her wrists one cuff at a time as her mind screamed at her to go for her gun instead. Amelia knew if she dared to go for her gun, Pete would shoot her dead on the spot. There see. Amelia held up her wrists. Pete, keeping his gun at the ready, walked over to Amelia and checked her jacket pockets. He found a loaded Glock 17 and snatched it away. Take a seat. Amelia sat down in a chair facing Pete's desk. Pete tossed the Glock 17 he found into a wooden trash can, walked behind his desk and plopped down. Junerson is in Snow Falls, Alaska. Don't play dumb with me, lady. I know he's after Sarah Garland, and I know that I was your target, he told Amelia. Cops aren't stupid, sister. But let me tell you, criminals are very, very stupid. If we can talk, I can explain. Pete held up a firm hand. I'll do the talking, he informed Amelia. Here's how this situation is gonna go, sister. You were sent to kill a retired cop. Instead you failed and now, Pete shook his head at Amelia, you're caught. But, 
Pete added and grabbed a cigar out of an ashtray with his left hand, there might be hope for you yet. Hope. You have two choices, death row or me. Pete tossed the cigar into his mouth and began chewing on it. Give me the information I want, and I'll let you walk. Your small change, sister. I want Junerson. And you better know that once I get Junerson, he's going to squeal on you like a kettle screaming on the boil. Pete grinned. Your only choice is to run like the wind, if, that is, you decide to help me. Personally, I think you'd be better off in prison where you'll be safe. Junerson isn't the forgiving kind, you know? Amelia watched Pete chew on his cigar. Was the man actually offering her freedom for information? She couldn't decide. Cops were clever. But Amelia quickly told herself, she wasn't a stupid woman. Had she not assisted Clint Junerson in all of his past killings? Yes. Had she not managed to force the justice system to release him early, after hiring a criminal to alter some court records that harmed the prosecuting attorney's case? Yes. Had she not been able to prove that Clint was the victim of a cruel society that ignored his cries for help by creating false psychiatric records? Bribed a corrupt judge to declare the murder charges against Clint null and void after that? Yes. So why was she feeling so stupid sitting in front of a used-up cop, after she had done all that? She had allowed Clint to transform her into a killer, visiting him, creating a kill list, tracking victims, and creating a life for the killer she was infatuated with outside of prison walls. Now she was trapped, and her brain wasn't functioning. Why? Because fear was clouding her mind, desperate fear. If she squealed on Clint, he would kill her, and if she was captured, well, the rules of the game were if you were captured, you died. Either way I'm dead, she whispered. Talk to me, Pete ordered. The southern border isn't too far away, sister, and the northern border isn't out of reach, either. You can run. Amelia stared into Pete's eyes. As she did, something odd happened. Her mind actually believed that the cop who had managed to outsmart her was actually telling the truth. What do you want to know? All the ABCs and 123s, sister, Pete told Amelia. How did Junerson find Sarah, for starters? I was the one who tracked Detective Garland, Amelia confessed. I hired a person to hack into her personnel file. Her social security number was taken. That was all I needed. You're a cop. You know that once you have a person's social security number, they can't hide from you. Pete leaned back in his office chair. It was just a waiting game then, right? Amelia reluctantly nodded her head yes. Clint ordered me to keep track of both you and Detective Garland. And you were happy to oblige. We wanted revenge, yes, Amelia confessed. Clint and I were murdering innocent people. Pete snapped. On track with our plans, Amelia stared at him, wavering in her cowardice. Fear and terror. Pete resisted the urge to spit in Amelia's face. Instead, he focused on Sarah. Junerson isn't stupid. What's he up to in Alaska? What are his plans? Amelia glanced down at her handcuffed wrists. She was trapped. There was no way out. If I tell you, will you let me go free? I'll let you run like a wild animal, Pete nodded his head. Junerson will catch up to you sooner or later. If he doesn't, the law will. Your only chance is to hightail it to the southern border or the northern border or start swimming toward Hawaii. Pete spat out his cigar, reached into the pocket of his overcoat, and pulled out a small tape recorder. I've already got enough on tape to send you to death row, sister. Amelia's eyes grew wide with fear. You've she whispered and stared at Pete in shock. You're just a stupid cop. It was Kelly, she was the one who betrayed Clint. I ordered Clint to kill her, but he refused. I warned him Kelly was going to betray us. By the time Clint agreed to kill Kelly, she planted the knife. Amelia sat in shock. You're just a stupid cop, but Kelly, if it wasn't for her, you would have never captured Clint. Pete grinned. Sister, you better start doing some talking or it's lights out for you. Emilia lowered her eyes and stared at the tape recorder 
and began wondering how a stupid cigar-smoking cop had outsmarted a woman who had outsmarted the system. Justice was truly blind. Pete called Sarah just as Amanda reached Tracy Farnsworth's cabin. Yes, Pete, what do you have? Sarah asked and patted Amanda's shoulder. Don't pull up in the driveway. Drive to the end of the street and park. We'll walk back to the cabin. Amanda nodded her head and slowly cruised by a gorgeous two-story cabin in a yard full of soft snowdrifts. Kiddo, you're in some hot water, Pete explained and quickly lit his cigar. Junerson isn't alone up there. I know that, Pete, Sarah replied in a calm voice. You do? Pete asked confused. Sarah glanced up at the gorgeous cabin as Amanda drove past and spotted smoke coming from the chimney. Tracy was home. Junerson has a decoy. Pete felt pride swell up in his chest. Hey kiddo, you've still got that beautiful mind I love so much. I wasn't sure if I was right or not, Sarah confessed. I was going off a hunch, Pete. Hunches can be wrong. Not yours, Pete assured Sarah. Junerson is going to have his decoy play it clean while he does all the killing. The decoy, some man named Howard Wilmington, an ex-con Junerson met up with in prison, had his face painted and altered to look identical to Junerson's. Pete puffed on his cigar. Both rats had their faces altered by some doctor who lost his license because he operated on a woman drunker than a skunk. Pete looked at Amelia. Amelia had her head ducked down in shame. Ms. Amelia Lopez, Junerson's little girlfriend, is sitting in front of me with a pair of cuffs on. She was kind enough to loosen her tongue up a bit. Sarah felt her heart begin to race. What do you have for me, Pete? But before you tell me, remind me to give you the biggest kiss the next time I see you. After I kiss you, you can tell me how you outsmarted your fish. I'll take some fresh cigars over the kiss, Pete chuckled. Deal. Pete leaned back in his desk chair. Okay, kiddo, here's the deal. Junerson managed to create a new person, this Austin McMill character, with the help of Ms. Lopez. Ms. Lopez seems to know some shady people who are good with those stupid computers. Sarah motioned toward a driveway belonging to a vacant cabin. Park there, she said. Amanda nodded her head, threw the jeep into four-wheel drive, eased down the snow-covered driveway, and parked in front of a closed two-car garage attached to the cabin. I got us in here but I'm not sure we're getting out, not the way this snow is falling, she warned. We'll get out, Sarah promised and placed the call on speakerphone. Okay Pete, Amanda is now on board. Keep talking. Pete worked on his cigar as he stared at Amelia. Underneath the woman's beauty lurked a deadly monster. Junerson made the same fake profile for Howard Wilmington. Same fingerprints the works. Amelia raised her head. Please let me go, she begged. I have contacts. I can be across the southern border within the hour. Please. Hold your tater's sister, Pete griped. I'm talking. Sarah watched the heavy snow strike the windshield. Pete, I think I understand what Junerson's plan is. I began to understand while I was pacing around Conrad's office. I began thinking about the Mafia families in New York. I'm glad the Mafia helped you, kiddo. It's not like I've been sitting on my tush, though. Old Pete still has some brains left in his old head. Oh, Pete, don't get upset, Sarah begged. I assumed Junerson was going to force me to look right when he was running left, that's all. Sarah closed her eyes and saw the face of a hideous Mafia boss. Back in the 60s, there was a Mafia boss who killed people by using his twin brother to do his killings while he walked around in public. Yeah, I know the story, kiddo. When Junerson showed up at the circus wearing a different face, I assumed he might try the same stunt. But the real kicker came when he asked a local girl out for dinner. That's when I finally had to tell myself that my theory was on track, Sarah explained. Pete, we both know Junerson loves riddles, and what better riddle to solve than trying to find out which Austin McMill is the real Clint Junerson? I could have been wrong, Pete. Kiddo, you're one smart cookie, Pete told Sarah in an affectionate voice. I knew you were special from the first day I saw you. Pete put his cigar down. Where are you now? Pete, if your theory is right about Junerson wanting me behind bars, and I'd bet my life that you are right, 
then I think Junerson will go after someone in Snow Falls who has some popularity. Sarah looked around. I took a chance and tagged Tracy Farnsworth. Pete rubbed his chin and tried to place the name. Isn't that the woman who was caught drinking and driving after she lost the Miss Alaska contest? Tracy came in second, yes, Sarah confirmed. Wasn't she some kind of actress before she got into doing beauty pageants? Tracy was an aerobics trainer who had her own television show. She landed a few small roles on some washed-out television shows that helped her get some quick fame. When her fame began to fade, she jumped into beauty competitions. Sarah looked at Amanda. We're no beauty queens, huh? This English muffin prefers to be a piece of dry bread, Amanda said and pointed toward Tracy's cabin. If fame means being like that snotty brat, then I'd rather be a piece of stale toast and spend my days shopping the discount racks at O'Malley's. Pete grinned. He could see Amanda shopping the discount racks at her favorite department store with a kosher chili dog in one hand and a cheeseburger in the other. Any sign of the guy, he asked Sarah. His twin will show up in town and have dinner with Lisa, Sarah said in a certain voice. By now, Junerson knows I'm trying to set a trap for him. All I can do is stake out Tracy's cabin and wait. Pete studied his cigar and decided he wanted it. Then get to work. We can chew the fat later. There's not much more I can tell you that will be helpful anyway, except for one very important piece of information. Yes? Sarah asked in a quick voice, hoping Pete had saved the best for last. Junerson has a weakness. I made his little girlfriend tell me all about it. Pete looked at Amelia. Amelia ducked her head down. What is it, Pete? What is Junerson's weakness? Sarah asked. Yeah, Pete, spill the beans, Amanda demanded. We need all the help we can get. You're down there in the warm sun, and we're trapped up north in a snowstorm, so stop beating around the bush. Pete chewed on his cigar and fought back a yawn. He needed sleep, but still had a long night ahead of him. Junerson is terrified of tight spaces. He's claustrophobic. What? Amanda asked and rolled her head. Pete, oh, I thought you had something. Oh, forget it, silly bloke. Wait a minute, Sarah urged Amanda. She rubbed her eyes and thought. Maybe she whispered and then said, Okay, Pete, I've got to get to work. I'll call you, and if I don't. You better, Pete demanded. I caught my fish, so do your job, detective, and catch your fish. I will, Sarah promised as the image of a sweet, innocent baby whispered into her troubled mind. She saw the baby sleeping in a blue bassinet, dreaming sweet dreams. I'll call you, Pete. Sarah ended the call. Let's move, Junebug. Into the snow we go. I assumed we weren't going to sit in this warm jeep all night, Amanda sighed and with much dread climbed out into the snow. A few miles away, Clint patted Howard Wilmington on his shoulder. There's going to be a trap waiting, he explained as heavy snow fell down onto Howard's hard face. Sarah Garland isn't a stupid woman, Howard. She's going to assume you're me and use that Lisa Dame to set a trap. And that's what you want, right? Howard asked, standing in front of a rental cabin covered with snow. Howard hated the snow. His idea of paradise was a tropical island of warm sand and fish fries. Clint nodded his head. Howard, I have Sarah Garland exactly where I want her, he grinned. She looked straight in these eyes of mine and saw me for who I really was. She knows I'm walking in her shadow, and she's terrified. So trust me and just do exactly as I tell you. What about my money? Howard dared to ask. Clint walked Howard over to a black truck. Amelia will wire you your money when the job is complete. She's funny that way. Me, I wouldn't have cared if she'd paid you from the start. Clint didn't tell Howard that after the man fulfilled his part of the deal, he was going to kill him. Now drive into town, go to the diner and charm Lisa. Don't panic when you see some plainclothes cops watching or a sniper sitting on a rooftop. You're clean unless you do something real stupid. My job is to have dinner with a pretty face and then drive back to the circus clean as a whistle. Exactly, Clint grinned. He patted Howard on his shoulder again. Sarah will follow you, of course. That's what I want. I need her out of town. 
Howard pointed at the snow-covered driveway. I may not be able to make it back to the circus. Not on your bike. I may need the truck. Snow is pretty bad. Clint had to agree that Howard made a good point. He walked his eyes around the heavy falling snow, studied the white frozen wood surrounding the cabin, and then looked back at Howard. Take the truck, but make sure you go back to the circus and stay the night in Amy's RV, got it? Howard gratefully nodded his head, checked the leather jacket he was wearing, and then pulled the driver's side door open. Clint, you're one clever guy, you know that? When we met up in prison, I thought you were insane. Clint looked Howard deep in his eyes. Insanity is in my grin, Howard. Never forget that, he said in a voice that sent chills down Howard's spine. You did me a favor by saving my life from that gang of inmates. I did you a favor by helping you get an early parole. Now it's time to work. Clint nodded at the truck. Get into town. I'll be in touch. Howard looked into Clint's face. Even though the man was sharing the same face he was wearing, his eyes were far different. Clint's eyes were soulless and filled with evil. Howard was just a petty bank robber. I have the cell phone on me, he said, hurried into the truck and waved at Clint as he backed down the driveway. Clint walked to his motorcycle, climbed on and grinned. Okay, Miss Farnsworth, it's time to die. But not to worry. Your death is going to help make the life of one certain cop very, very miserable. Clint brought his motorcycle to life and slowly began making his way toward Tracy Farnsworth's cabin. A half hour later he rode past the cabin, spotted chimney smoke, and then cruised on down the snowy street, allowing his eyes to study each cabin. By now, darkness had fallen, and it was difficult to tell the make and model of the vehicles parked in dark driveways, which was why he didn't see Sarah's jeep parked in the driveway of the vacant cabin. All Clint saw was snowy darkness. He turned his bike around, drove back to Tracy's cabin and parked next to her mailbox. Now it's time to have a little fun. Clint yanked the muffler hat off his head, shoved it into his coat pocket, pulled out a creepy clown mask, donned the mask, and then looked up at the cabin with a hideous grin on his face. Time to play. Inside the cabin, Tracy Farnsworth was about to have a mental breakdown. Amanda was having a hard time calming her down. Will you stop being silly? Amanda begged. She threw a hard finger at a large front living room window covered over with a dark green drape. My best friend is out in that snow risking her life to save your tush girly. So you better not do anything stupid. Tracy Farnsworth staggered over to a stone fireplace and began warming her shaking hands. Amanda had to admit that Tracy was a beautiful woman, barely 28 years old. Tracy had silky black hair and eyes that could melt stone and a face that could make hearts stare for hours. Yet Amanda knew that underneath all the beauty lingered a selfish, bitter drunk who was uglier than a moldy muffin. I'm not going to be used as some type of, of puppet, Tracy snapped at Amanda slurring her words. Amanda looked at the thick green robe Tracy was wearing and then glanced at a coffee table in front of the fireplace. The coffee table held two empty wine bottles. It was obvious that Tracy Farnsworth was sauced. Just you keep quiet, Amanda warned Tracy, and be grateful my best friend figured out just who Clint Junerson was intending to make his first official victim. You out, Tracy ordered Amanda and hiccuped. You leave before I call my mother and have her order you to leave. My mother is a movie producer. Tracy nearly lost her balance and fell into the side of the fireplace. Amanda rolled her eyes. I'm going to be a star, you get out. Oh, go shove a muffin in your ear, Amanda snapped at Tracy, hurried to the front door and resisted the urge to rush out into the snow and find Sarah. Sarah was hiding behind a woodpile watching Clint Junerson's dark shadow slowly creep toward the cabin. In her mind she saw the hideous snowman that lived in her heart hissing at her through the snow, coming for you, Sarah. I'm here, nowhere to run, time to pay the piper, oh yes, Sarah, it's time to pay. Sarah shook the image out of her mind and focused on Clint's dark shadow. When Clint was close enough to the front door, she yanked out her cell phone and sent Amanda a text. The text read, party time. Amanda received the text and jumped into action. She ran across the living room and turned on a very expensive radio. Loud workout music boomed into the air. Well, that's all we've got, 
Amanda winced, covered her ears, and ran back to the front door. Hey, turn that down, Tracy demanded. Amanda rolled her eyes, left the front door, ran to Tracy, and slugged the woman in the face. Tracy crashed down onto the floor and went into a deep sleep. Silly woman, Amanda fussed. You stay there. Now I have to get to the kitchen. Clint, hearing the music start, paused at the front door and looked around. Basement, he whispered and eased back into the snow. Sarah watched. Chapter 8 Clint moved through the icy darkness, forcing his legs to walk through deep snow, and worked his way around to the back of Tracy's cabin. He stopped for a second, looked over his shoulder, saw only snow falling, and moved on to a wooden basement door. The lock on the basement door was covered with snow and ice. Clint quickly removed his lock-picking device and began working to break the ice free. A few minutes later he found success, popped the basement door open, and walked into a dark basement spacious enough to be comfortable but too closed in for Clint to be comfortable. This is my night, Clint whispered under the hideous clown mask, I'm in control. Clint closed the basement door without locking it, assuming Sarah was in town chasing his decoy, and began slithering toward a set of wooden stairs. Sarah quickly ran to the closed basement door and examined it. The door opened outward and not inward, which was perfect. Without wasting a second, she began making painfully slow trips to the wood pile and back, carrying armloads of wood and stacking it against the basement door. As she worked on the door, Clint climbed the wooden steps and reached a closed door that opened up into the kitchen. The door was locked. No big deal. Clint would pick the lock and sneak into the living room. He could hear the loud music playing and wasn't sure if Tracy had company or not. Maybe the woman was simply working out? Who knows? What Clint did know was that the clown was loose and the clown would have the last laugh. He shoved the lock-picking device into the lock and went to work. Seconds later, the lock gave. Perfect. Clint placed the device back into his pocket, pulled out a vicious gun, and slowly turned the doorknob. What? he asked. The doorknob turned in his hand easily enough, but when he tried to ease the door open he met resistance. What is this? Amanda saw the basement door trying to be opened. She stepped back behind a fancy wooden table blocking it, squatted down, aimed her gun at the door and waited. If Clint Junerson did manage to break through the door she and Sarah had nailed boards across, she would shoot him. Oh, why do you need a confession? She asked Sarah in a low, scared whisper. Why can't we kill this bloke and get it over with? Sarah didn't hear Amanda. She continued to pile armloads of wood against the basement door, working hard, fighting through the snow, building up a sweat. Have to hurry, no time. Sarah said, breathing hard, carrying snow-covered armloads of firewood. Trip by trip, she piled wood against the basement door. Finally, after what seemed forever, she stopped and examined the back door and nodded her head. There's no way he's opening this door from inside the basement, and there's no windows, she said in a relieved voice. The back door was now blocked by a mountain of wood. Time to get inside. Sarah hurried to the back door and gave a secret knock. Oh, about time, Amanda said in a relieved voice. She ran to the back door and pulled Sarah inside. He's trying to get through the basement door, she whispered in a nervous voice. Sarah stepped into a warm kitchen that reminded her of a fancy kitchen she had seen on some cooking show. Back door is secure, she whispered back, breathing hard. I've never been so tired in all of my life. Amanda closed the back door. Miss Beauty Queen is out cold, I kinda had to hit her, she explained in a low whisper. Our hidden queen did her job, Sarah whispered back and quickly focused her eyes on the basement door. She could see the doorknob slowly turning back and forth, and the door itself pressing against the wood she and Amanda had used to nail it shut. The clown is captured, she said in a relieved voice. Junebug, I wasn't sure we could capture him, time sure wasn't on our side. Let's kill him please, Amanda begged. I wish we could, Sarah explained in a regretful voice. I'm a cop, Junebug. If I take my gun and shoot through that door as much as I want to, I'm no better than Clint Junerson. Junerson will die in prison, along with his girlfriend. The good guys always finish last, love, Amanda warned. That monster will never stop trying to get at you, and when the day arrives for you to become a mommy, oh love, just kill him, Amanda begged. 
Sarah saw herself holding a sweet baby boy, cradling the baby with loving arms, and then she saw a hideous clown's face peering through a window at her. How easy would it be for her to kill Clint Junerson? She was tempted. Then her mind saw the faces of the people Clint had murdered, faces that deserved justice. Clint Junerson was going to sit on death row until his day to be put to death arrived. I wish I could, Sarah said and patted Amanda on her shoulder. Watch my back. Oh, love. Amanda sighed miserably. I, okay, I'll watch your back. Sarah nodded her head, eased over to the basement door, placed her back up against the kitchen wall, and yelled, Hey, Junerson, having trouble opening the door? Clint froze. Did he actually hear Sarah Garland's voice? The basement door was thick, sturdy, and very difficult to hear through. Garland, he whispered under the clown's mask. Sarah waited a second and yelled out, I have you trapped, Junerson. The cabin is surrounded. You're not leaving that basement alive. Yes, Clint thought, Sarah Garland was talking to him. You're dead, he hissed, then turned and ran down the dark stairs and tried to open the basement door that led to the yard. What, what is this? Clint pushed against the door but found that the door would barely budge. As he shoved against the door, the darkness of the basement began to creep in on him. Suddenly he felt like the walls were closing in. His breathing became panicked. No, he whispered, ripped off the clown's mask and began searching for a light. Upstairs. Sarah let out a breath she didn't realize she'd been holding. Okay, June Bug, call Andrew and tell him to arrest Lisa's date and then to get over here with any available men. Hurry. Got it. Amanda pulled out her cell phone and called Andrew. We have the real killer trapped. Arrest Lisa's date and hurry to Tracy Farnsworth's cabin. Andrew peered through the front diner window and saw Howard Wilmington sitting at a booth with a very nervous Lisa. Only Lisa didn't know she was talking to a petty bank robber who had had his face altered. Lisa believed she was having dinner with a deadly killer, and so did Andrew. What in the world is going on, Amanda? he demanded. We'll explain later. Just hurry you bloke, Amanda fussed. Yeah, I'll hurry. Andrew shook his head at the snow, wondered what he had ever done to deserve to be stuck with two women like Sarah and Amanda, and then hurried into the diner with his gun drawn. Hands in the air, he yelled at Howard. Howard dropped a cheeseburger out of sheer panic, then bolted to his feet and tried to run. Andrew tackled him down to the floor, and had him handcuffed within seconds. Get this guy to the station, he yelled at Mitch. The rest of you guys come with me. We have to get to Tracy Farnsworth's cabin. Hurry. What about me? Lisa asked, sitting in shock. Pay the tab, Andrew told Lisa and ran back outside in the snow. Clint found a light switch and flicked it. No light answered his request. Sarah had removed all the light bulbs from the basement. What is this? he hissed, kicking himself for not bringing a flashlight. Never once had Clint ever needed assistance roaming around in the dark. He was a killer. Now his heart pounded painfully behind his ribs, and the air felt as heavy as the darkness around him. The cabin is surrounded, Junerson, Sarah yelled. You better give yourself up. I'm going to kill you. Clint hollered. His voice was captured by a tape recorder. Sarah grinned, knowing she finally had the evidence they needed. Clint ran back up the basement stairs and punched the door. I'm going to kill you, Garland, just like I killed all of my victims. I'm going to put a knife in your back, do you hear me? Unaware that Amelia had been captured, Clint believed his hidden wild card would always be able to secure his freedom. Sure, he was in a bind, and he might even be arrested. But so what? Amelia would get him off, and then he would make Sarah suffer. No, I'm not going to kill you, he yelled. I'm going to carry out my original plan. I'm going to make you suffer, Garland. Suffer, do you hear me? Sarah kept her back pressed up against the kitchen wall. Why did you kill those people, Junerson? She yelled through the basement door. They were innocent. The clown kills Garland. People want the clown to perform, but they don't understand. It all comes with a cost. I'm the clown. I kill. Clint glanced over his shoulder at the darkness that was quickly closing in over his mind. 
He slammed his eyes closed and tried to focus on nothing but his rage. I killed my victims because the clown has to be fed. Sarah rolled her eyes. She was sick and tired of killers spouting off insane calamities to create fear and terror. Give me a break, Junerson. You killed those innocent people because you're nothing but a sick mental case. Clint didn't like being insulted by a cop. You're going to suffer, Garland, he yelled and punched the wooden door again. Sarah closed her eyes, allowed the faces of Clint's victims to appear in her mind, and began naming them off one by one. You killed them, Junerson. Clint felt a hideous grin rip across his face. Yeah, I killed them, Garland. I killed everyone you named, and I'll continue to kill. Do you hear me? The clown doesn't die. Maybe not yet, Sarah whispered. She opened her eyes, wiped away tears that were falling for the victims Clint had killed, and walked over to an extension cord she had run up the basement stairs. Going to be loud, she warned Amanda. Amanda backed up to the kitchen door and covered her ears. Okay, love, let him have it. Sarah nodded her head and plugged in the cord. A loud screaming sound shattered the silence in the basement. You scream good, Junebug, Sarah yelled over the noise. Let's just hope that monster doesn't find the hidden speakers, Amanda yelled back. I'm not even sure why you wanted to record me screaming to begin with. Sarah focused on the basement door. I want Junerson to suffer, real justice, she answered. A bullet is too good for him. Clint threw his hands over his ears at the piercing sounds, panic rising in his throat. He stumbled down the basement steps, nearly falling. He found his way back to the other door and began kicking it. The door wouldn't budge. The mountain of wood stacked against the back door held. Stop it! Clint screamed as fear and panic began to consume his mind. Stop it, stop that sound, do you hear me, enough? Clint began firing his gun into the darkness. Outside. Sarah yelled. She flung open the kitchen door and pushed Amanda outside just as bullets began erupting through the kitchen floor. As Sarah jumped out into the snow, one bullet struck her right leg. She let out a painful cry, but managed to escape the rest of the bullets Clint was blindly firing. Love? Amanda screamed. She crawled through the icy snow and grabbed Sarah. Love, where are you hurt? Talk to me. Sarah leaned up in the snow and pointed to her right leg. I'm okay, she promised Amanda in a pained voice, looked back at the kitchen and actually smiled. Let the darkness consume him, she told Amanda. Let justice be served. Amanda looked deep into Sarah's eyes and for the first time understood what mysteries were roaming in her best friend's mind. Sarah wasn't just a cop. She was a woman fighting to be free of her own nightmares. The monster locked in the dark basement, trapped by the sounds of a woman screaming, was absorbing all of Sarah's fears, horrors, nightmares, and screams. Love? Sarah checked her leg and spotted blood. She didn't care. It's okay, Junebug, this was meant to happen. Now in time, I can have my baby. Amanda felt confused but didn't say so. Instead, she cradled Sarah in her arms and held her best friend tight. Clint wasn't aware that Sarah had been shot. He was frantically running around the basement, trying to find a way out, running blindly into shelves and old broken furniture. Have to get out of here, he cried out in a desperate whimper, let me out, please let me out, let me out. Clint ran back up the basement steps and began banging on the door. Let me out of here. Garland, let me out of here. When no one answered, Clint turned and ran back down the basement steps. This time as he did, his feet became tangled up. He lost his balance and tumbled down the stairs. The gun Clint was holding, still retaining one last bullet, went off. The single bullet pulled Clint into an eternal darkness he would never escape from. As Clint died, he reached out and felt the hideous clown mask he had been wearing lying close to him. He grabbed the clown mask and managed to toss it over his face before he took his last breath. The clown does die, oh, I die, Clint whispered and then closed his eyes into a darker blackness than the one Sarah had trapped him in. Poor Tracy Farnsworth, unaware of what was happening inside of her cabin, stumbled into the kitchen, saw Sarah and Amanda lying in the snow and simply slammed the back door shut. My cabin stay out, she yelled. Amanda rolled her eyes. Remind me to deck that snotty brat again, she told Sarah. 
Sarah placed her head down onto Amanda's lap, allowed the heavy falling snow to hit her beautiful face, and saw the face of a beautiful baby appear. It's okay now, mommy. The monster is dead, the baby whispered. Yes, the monster is dead. Sarah whispered back, feeling the hideous snowman she had created slithering away into the darkness. The snowman paused, turned to Sarah with a sneer and hissed, I'll be back Sarah, the clown is dead but the snowman never dies, I'll be back. She's your wife, Andrew fussed at Conrad. If I had known what was going on in her mind, I wouldn't have let her out of my sight. Andrew walked to the back door of Sarah's cabin, shoved on a muffler hat and shook his head. Howard Wilmington gave us a good confession. Clint Junerson is dead. Amelia Lopez is going to spend what time she has left on death row. So this case ended in our favor, at least there's that. Sarah glanced over at Pete. Pete sat chewing on a cigar. More coffee, Pete, she asked. More coffee? Andrew asked and rolled his eyes. Sarah, you're going to drive me insane one of these days. Andrew opened the back door. Next time, let's handle our law enforcement duties more rationally, okay? He begged. I mean, you could have told me what you were thinking, Sarah, and we could have captured Clint Junerson. I needed a confession, Sarah reminded Andrew. And we were never going to get it if we brought him in and tried the usual interrogation techniques. Yeah, I guess you're right. Andrew rubbed the back of his neck as a hard snow began floating through the back door. He looked deeply into Sarah's eyes. I'll never understand the darkness you fight in, Sarah. Sarah glanced down at her right leg. Doc Downing had managed to pull a bullet out of her calf without much worry. Drive safe. Snowstorm is due to hit snowfalls tonight. Weatherman said it's going to be bad. I'm going to drive straight home, take a hot shower, defrost, get in my jogging pants and watch some old hockey games I recorded. Mitch and Andy are watching the station and you, Andrew pointed at Conrad, stay home from now on where you belong. Conrad stood up, walked to the back door and patted Andrew on his shoulder. I guess I shouldn't blame you. I'm sorry I got upset, okay? Friends? You know we're friends for life, Conrad, Andrew said in a tired voice. Bring Sarah and Pete over for dinner tomorrow night, okay? My wife wants to cook up a feast. We'll do, Conrad promised. Andrew looked at Sarah and let a smile touch his eyes. Someday you're going to have to teach me to think outside of the box, detective. When you do, I'll learn how to make sure I get a donut before they're all gone. Sarah smiled back. Go home, chief. Your family is waiting for you. Yeah, take a hike, you bloke, Amanda ordered Andrew. She grabbed a homemade cinnamon roll and handed it to him. One for the road. Thanks, Andrew told Amanda, waved goodbye and stepped out into the snow. Conrad closed the back door and focused on Sarah. I'm not happy with you. Sarah stared at her husband. Conrad stood wearing his normal black leather jacket that made him look like a handsome man preparing to take on a street full of thugs. I know you aren't, honey. I realize that I should have called you, but... You were worried this Junerson person might have killed me. Yeah, you told me your reason, Sarah. Conrad walked to the kitchen counter poured himself a cup of coffee, and looked at Manford. Manford shrugged his shoulders. You should have called me. You're not innocent. Hey, I was just taking orders, Manford winced. He tossed a thumb at Sarah and Amanda. Those two dames are the ones to blame, not me. Amanda tugged on the brown sweater Manford was wearing. Take a hike, you. Yeah, yeah, always take a hike, Manford grumbled. I'll be in the living room watching a Jimmy Stewart movie. Pete took his eyes to Amanda. Amanda was standing very pretty, in a light-colored green blouse draped over a tan dress that her husband had sent her as a gift from London. The woman gave off the appearance of a tired wife waiting for her dear husband to return from war. Want to go to O'Malley's before the plows stop running? He asked her. My treat. Really? Amanda asked in a shocked voice. You bet, Pete said, chewing on his cigar. He placed his hands in the pockets of a brown overcoat. I think Sarah and Conrad need some time alone. Pete nodded toward the living room. We'll take Manford with us. That little runt should have left town with the circus, Amanda teased. 
Lacey fired him, Sarah explained. Of course, she fired him because of me. Lacey fired him because she knew you needed help, Amanda corrected Sarah. She walked over to the kitchen table and checked Sarah's leg. You look very lovely in your new blue sweater and dress. The color covers your hurt leg nicely, she said, struggling to sound supportive and then simply let out a heavy breath. Oh love, that bullet could have. But it didn't, Sarah promised. She grabbed Amanda's hand, pulled her down, and hugged her. Junebug, I'll be up and walking in no time. In the meantime, take Pete up on his offer and go spend the morning at O'Malley's. On the way home, stop at the diner and grab me a cheeseburger plate, okay? How can a gal pass up such an offer? Amanda smiled. She kissed Sarah on her forehead, and then walked over to Conrad and took his hands. Go easy on my girl, she begged. She's a real hero, you know. And so is Pete. They captured two very mean people. I'm surprised the governor hasn't kicked her out of the state yet, Conrad complained. Amanda rolled her eyes. Come on, Pete, let's get the little runt and get out of here before World War III starts. Pete stood up and patted Sarah on her shoulder. I'll be back for dinner, and we'll spend the night talking about the good old days, kiddo. I'll have the coffee waiting, Sarah promised. Pete smiled and left the kitchen with Amanda. Alone at last, Conrad said in a grateful voice. He walked over to the kitchen table, looked down at Mittens and shook his head. And where were you during all of this? Mittens covered her nose and let out a whine. Honey please, Sarah begged. Yeah yeah. Conrad plopped down in a chair and folded his arms. We're supposed to be a team, Sarah. And I'm supposed to be the man of this family. Call me old-fashioned, but that's just the way a man should be. Sarah bent down and ran her hand around a white bandage that was wrapped around her calf. I didn't want you to end up like my ex-husband Conrad. The back alley killer killed him. I didn't want Junerson taking away the man I love. The man I want to be the father of my children. The man I want to spend the rest of my life with. Sarah kept her eyes low. From the moment I was told Brett Slopes had been killed, I knew Conrad and I became terrified. Everything I've been fighting for was placed in danger. Junerson was threatening to destroy my, my heart. Sarah? Listen to me, Sarah begged. She raised her eyes and looked at her husband. I lost my first husband because I chose to be a cop instead of a wife. He was killed because of me. I wasn't going to lose you because I was choosing to be a wife instead of a cop. Conrad, I had to be a cop again, it was the only way. I had to walk into Junerson's dark mind and figure out the riddle he was playing. Sarah reached across the table and touched Conrad's hand. I can't lose you. Conrad looked into Sarah's beautiful eyes and saw a tear fall. Honey, you're not going to lose me, he promised, stood up, went to Sarah and wrapped his arms around her. Listen, what's done is done, okay? I, I'm not angry anymore. Sarah gently placed her arms around Conrad. I'm sorry I didn't call you. I was wrong. No you weren't, Conrad confessed in a soft voice. You were trying to protect me, our future son. Conrad leaned up, wiped Sarah's tears away and forced a smile to his weary face. Listen, I'm going to talk to Andrew and tell him I need more time off. But you. Conrad touched Sarah's lips with a soft kiss. Let Andrew fire me if he wants, but I think you need a vacation. A vacation? Sarah asked. A sense of hope and excitement suddenly rushed into her heart. Yes, a vacation would be nice, honey. But where? London, Conrad told Sarah and tossed a thumb toward the living room. I think Amanda needs to see her husband. The poor girl sure stands by you, Sarah, and she deserves a break too. Yes, she does. Sarah agreed in a loving voice. Amanda is more special than anyone can realize. Sarah looked toward the living room. Okay, London it is, she smiled and kissed her husband. Thank you, honey. Conrad kissed Sarah back. You can thank me by doing a week's worth of dishes after your leg heals, he joked and then called out, Amanda, will you come in here? Amanda ran into the kitchen with her coat half on. What is it? Junebug, are you okay? Do you need some aspirin? Talk to me. Sarah let out a sweet giggle and held her arms out. 
Come here, sweetie. Amanda walked over to Sarah and let her best friend engulf her. How does two weeks in London sound, all expenses paid? Amanda's eyes grew large with shock. June bugged, don't tease this tired girl, she begged as tears began flowing from her eyes. Who is teasing? Conrad asked. He formed a sincere smile. Amanda, you've been standing beside Sarah from day one. You're a hero in my book, he explained. Heroes need a break sometimes, don't you think? Oh, you silly bloke, Amanda cried. She hugged Conrad's neck. Oh, I better get to O'Malley's. I have dresses to buy, and then I have to call the airport and Anne. Amanda paused. Hey, when are we leaving? Monday, Conrad smiled. I already have the airline tickets bought, and the hotel rooms reserved. Really? Sarah asked in a shocked voice. Conrad nodded his head. Why do you think Pete is here? Sarah looked at Amanda with confused eyes. Pete flew up to check on me. And to go to London, Pete said, appearing in the kitchen doorway with Manford. I figured my old body could use a break. Hey, Conrad invited me too, Manford chimed in. He looked at Sarah and smiled. Don't forget the small guy. Never, Conrad laughed. He put his arm around Manford and looked at Sarah. Okay, Sarah, all of your family is present and we're all going to London together. Sarah felt tears begin to spill down her face. Conrad, I, how did you know this is what? Pete went to Sarah and took her hands. Kiddo, even us cops have to escape the darkness sometimes, he said in a gentle voice. Conrad called me and we had a long talk. We both agreed that it's time for you to retire from being a cop. Now, before you say no, I have to tell you that the decision has already been made. I've decided to let an old friend, who just retired from the force, take your place at our detective agency. But Pete, I... No buts, kiddo. Pete gently touched Sarah's belly. You have more important things to focus on, kiddo. I want to see your kid before I get too old to remember my own name. Pete looked into Sarah's tear-filled eyes. It's time to let go, Sarah, he said in a voice that Sarah had never heard Pete speak in before. You did your job, and you did it real good. Now it's time to let go of Los Angeles, of the past, and focus on your future. Pete touched Sarah's belly again. It's time to be a mommy, and time to stop being a cop. Sarah stared into Pete's face and broke down. She threw her arms around his neck and held him tight. Okay, Pete, I'll let go, she promised. But I'm never letting go of you. I'll always be just a plain right away, kiddo, Pete whispered. Oh, someone get me some tissues, Amanda begged. Conrad looked down at Manford and saw tears sitting in his eyes. You too, he asked. Ah, uh, it's something in the air, Manford said, wiped at his eyes and then let out a tough cough. Are we going to O'Malley's or what? He barked. I don't have all day. Pete smiled, kissed Sarah on her nose, and then gently checked her leg. I'll bring you back a cheeseburger, he promised, threw his arm around Amanda and left the kitchen. Conrad smiled. Pete told me that being angry at you wouldn't do any good. I wanted to be angry, and I was, but I understand why you fought your snowman alone, Sarah. So your anger this morning, it was all an act. Sarah asked. Conrad nodded his head yes. I wanted to completely surprise you, and make you sweat a little. I know you had your reasons and I accept that, but if you would have? Conrad stopped talking, went to Sarah, took her hands and looked into her eyes. You're all I have, Sarah. You're my family, my wife, my everything. If Junerson would have killed. Junerson is dead, honey. We can walk away from the clown. Sarah whispered and kissed Conrad. The clown is dead, and this tired cop is closed for business. Conrad wasn't so sure. What about the snowman, Sarah? He asked in a worried voice. Your snowman will never leave you alone. I think Pete knows that, too. Sarah didn't answer Conrad. The telephone rang before she could say a word. Answer the phone, honey, she said, expecting the caller to be a deadly killer. Conrad answered the call. Hello, yes, oh? Conrad covered the phone with one hand. It's the airline. I'll be a few minutes. Sarah leaned back in her chair and watched Conrad fussing with a ticket agent. 
What else was there to do? Listening to her husband fuss was just the right medicine, a medicine filled with normalcy. However, far, far away in a seaside village in England, normalcy was being destroyed. A woman was planning out a hideous murder that was going to force Sarah to end her retirement and put back on her badge. Yes, Sarah, the snowman laughed while chewing on a candy cane. I'm everywhere you can't hide from me, not even in the snow. The snowman laughed again and walked away singing, Oh, the weather outside is frightful but the fire inside is delightful, oh, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Sarah heard the snowman singing, but pushed the voice away from her mind. For the time being, it was just nice listening to her husband yell at a ticket agent who had somehow messed up the reservations. She gently touched her belly and smiled. Soon we'll be together, she whispered, when mommy chases the snowman away. Thanks for listening to Snow Laughing Matter. Book 12 from Alaska Cozy Mystery Series by Wendy Meadows. And read for you by Madison from Google AI. For more information on Wendy's available books, visit www.wendymeadows.com.